Good evening, West Orange. It is Tuesday, February 23rd, 2016. Now, welcome to our conference meeting agenda. Madam Clerk. This is to inform the general public that this meeting is being held in compliance with Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975. A notice of this meeting was emailed to the Star Ledger and the West Orange Chronicle on October 14, 2015. A notice of this meeting was also posted on the bulletin board in the Municipal Building, West Orange, and filed in the office of the Municipal Clerk of the Township of West Orange on October 14, 2015. Councilwoman Casalino? Present. Councilman Garino? Present. Councilman Krakowiak? Present. Councilwoman McCartney? Present. Council President Cirillo? Present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we, we're we're going to begin with the uh, Downtown West Orange presentation. We have our Executive Director, Megan Brill, with us tonight. Megan, what's good in the downtown? All good things. Um, we have uh, three things that we'd like to talk about tonight. Uh, again, I'm Megan Brill, uh, Executive Director of Downtown Alliance. We have um, the National Historic Museum sure. is celebrating the uh, centennial of all the national parks in the country. It's their 100th anniversary. So in doing so, the park's going to have a lot more uh, visual signage talking about the rich heritage that Edison provided to the whole you know, world, from light bulbs to phonographs to um, all kinds of stuff. So what's currently out on Main Street now are a series of 12 banners that uh, talk about Edison. They're kind of neat. They're up high on the poles. They're the same size as our regular banners, but they have uh, the Edison uh, logo on it. They have the National Park's arrow on there, and, um, and they're just kind of neat. So take a look. Slow down while you're passing the museum. Uh, they'd appreciate that. In addition, there was a National Parks uh, commercial that's out. Out of 459 national parks in the whole country, uh, our national park gets like a six second or an eight second you know, snipping in there. It goes by real quick, but when you see it, it um, it's titled Your Park. And, uh, and it's kind of neat that our park got included in there. Uh, in addition to that, we have news about the farmer's market. We uh, have decided not to hold it this year. So there'll be no market sponsored by the Downtown Alliance for 2016. If there is an organization that wants to do it, I can talk to you about what's needed and um, if you want to try to undertake it in downtown or some other part of town, um, you know, we'd be willing to talk to you, but we just thought that our resources would be dedicated in, uh, in a different area. We thank all the patrons and residents that have supported it over the last 12 years. Um, and we're going to regroup and see what we can figure out for 2017. Okay, the last thing I have to talk about is Joe Fagan. Joe is our town historian and he works with the Downtown Alliance. Come on up, Joe. Joe's going to talk about the next phase of our historical marker initiative. Good evening. I, I will be brief. Our, uh, uh, as you may know, our uh, Historic Marker Initiative took a major step forward this past February 5th with the uh, dedication of the Anna Easter Brown Marker on Mount Pleasant Avenue in front of the West Orange Public Library. It was a tremendous ceremony, well attended, 250, 300 people. Uh, the uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha really came out in force. Um, just briefly, uh, I'd like to add that this Historic Marker Initiative program has been in the works for quite some time. Uh, we actually spoke about getting something rolling uh, on this last year, and uh, Tammy Williams actually came uh, forward with the Anna Easter Brown uh, marker at the right time, and we're using this as a springboard uh, for our, our program. Um, I, we, we launched a, a major fundraising effort since these markers will be paid for uh, out of private funds and not, not out of the existing uh, downtown West Orange Alliance budget. And uh, my goal that I set forward uh, for this year was to raise uh, $10,000 in private funds and um, to hopefully have eight markers in place by the end of the year. All the markers will be similar in design and format, so it will create a recognizable brand. Uh, I'm pleased to say that since mid-January, we have raised uh, $2,000 in actual donations and an additional $2,000 in pledges. So. Uh, we're almost 40% funded, at least 40% funded, towards my goal of $10,000. Uh, the next marker that we are very close to ordering, it's just tweaking a few words, 
in the, uh, in, in the text of the marker is for Mary Williams. Um, I won't go into detail about her story now, uh, but it's something I've talked about and wrote about in the past, and it's going to go at the uh, Quigley lot across from uh, Our Lady of Lourdes School. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'd be glad to address them at this point. Tell us about, I'm sorry, no, uh, Councilman, please. I was just going to say, I was going to mention this uh, during Council Liaisons, but I uh, can take this opportunity too. The West Orange Historic Preservation Commission would very much like to meet with you and anybody else who's helping you with that uh, because, as you can tell from the title, uh, they want to be involved with uh, uh, historic uh, preservation and, and uh, would like to help with this. So perhaps you could, you and whoever else is helping you, could come to the next meeting and uh, uh, discuss it in more detail. Well, we certainly would welcome their input or anyone's input um, uh, or help in, in raising the funds, certainly. Um, we're kind of focusing, Joe, on uh, markers for downtown at this point. Uh, hopefully, at some point in the future, they can expand town-wide. Uh, our, our goal is to uh, place these markers downtown and uh, to draw attention to the downtown area to uh, benefit our businesses uh, by uh, uh, increasing interest in the downtown uh, shopping district. Uh, so we certainly would, uh, would welcome the help uh, or input of uh, any organization or any individual. Um, but at this point, we feel that this is a downtown West Orange Alliance initiative. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, to my knowledge, has placed plaques uh, at, um, on historic houses uh, in the past. And um, that's an important um, uh, program as well. This is a bit different than uh, placing a, a plaque at a house. This is a, uh, a regular roadside marker. I'm sure you've seen them before. And uh, as I say, we're looking to create a recognizable brand where the, uh, as soon as someone sees this roadside marker, they will and immediately recognize it as such. And it's, uh, it's probably a bit different than what the Historic Preservation Commission has been doing with their plaques. But we certainly would welcome their input or anyone's input on, uh, on the markers. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, it is not just people. Uh, we, and, and I just, uh, discussed this with Michelle earlier this week. Uh, we have some guidelines um, that we set forth, and uh, it's not just people, it's also locations that we intend to uh, mark, and the subject uh, must be deceased or in cases of location be obsolete for a minimum period of 50 years. Uh, we, we want the, uh, after 50 years, if the person or place is still relevant, uh, and the subject or location must have a discernible connection to West Orange either as a former resident or, or place of interest and achieved widespread recognition in their field of endeavor or impacted West Orange history in some way. Um, and as I say, all the plaques are privately funded, but what we're looking to avoid is uh, someone or uh, an individual or a group coming forward and says, uh, you know, my, my father served in World War II and uh, uh, we want to put up a plaque for him. Uh, and not to uh, discredit or discount the importance of his contribution, but it doesn't rise to the level of a plaque uh, merely for a fact that a person uh, uh, served uh, in the armed forces of this country or something of a similar nature. Um, as they say, it must have some widespread recognition uh, in, in, in terms of impacting West Orange history. Yes. Sir, I have a question. Uh, tell us again uh, where we can uh, go to get information on how to make donations to your cause. And thank you again for bringing attention to uh, the historical significance that our town has to offer. Well, well, thank you, Victor. And uh, uh, I'm just one of many people that do that, but I appreciate your, your recognition. Um, uh, donations can be made to the uh, payable to the Downtown West Orange Alliance. Uh, here at 66 Main Street, West Orange, New Jersey. And um, donations have ranged from $5 to $1,000. So we're looking for contributions in, in, in any amount. And how do you raise $10,000? Well, very simply, $1 at a time. And that's what we're doing and uh, on our way to accomplishing, hopefully. Okay. Do you have a question? What, do, what is the range of the markers? How much do they cost individually? Uh, I'm sorry for neglecting to mention that. Uh, the uh, average cost of the marker is going to be $1,000. 
and it's a, a very high quality marker. It's 24 by 18. Uh, if you see the one in front of the library for Anna Easter Brown, they're all going to be the similar size color. And it's actually a uh, double-sided, single-cast aluminum. So, and it's a raised lettering, uh, raised letters. So it's, uh, it's very high quality. It's, it's uh, custom to what you would see on other historic markers, uh, markers in other communities. Uh, so it's really high, something that's high quality that will um, be there for quite some time. And there's a QR code on there uh, that will be on each marker. And uh, some say the QR code is outdated. Uh, but what the QR code will do is it will bring you to the website, and uh, to our website. And on the website, there will be additional information uh, where we'll, because um, we're limited on the marker as to what we can say. Uh, the text on the marker will only represent a small portion of the story about the place or individual. And uh, with the QR code, it will redirect to the website where we can go into much more detail with, uh, with more vintage photos. And in the process, we hope to create a uh, walking tour where people will want to walk from one marker to another marker uh, to learn more about the history and in the process uh, familiarize themselves with the many businesses in the downtown. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? No, just, just thank you, Joe, for putting all this together. Uh, and, your well, and, and the Downtown Alliance. Well, thank you. Um, and, and Tammy, again, for bringing it, the idea. You know, you're working on it, but starting the ball rolling. Is there anything I missed, Megan? <laughs> uh, we have to thank Karen for databasing all the checks. Thank you, Karen. I was, I was surprised that we probably got 38 or 40 checks already. Um, and it's, it's a lot of work just keeping track. We want people that have made a larger donation, we want to send a thank you note. So being able to really track it and then you know, provide the thank yous. And when we place the markers, we want to send invitations out. So being able to have that information that I don't necessarily have to do is really great. So we really appreciate, appreciate that. And uh, thanks, Joe. Th this is something that Joe's been talking about almost since he landed with the Downtown Alliance. And it really was the springboard after Anna Easter Brown to be able to dedicate you know, Mary Williams. And the story about Mary Williams is great, almost as good as Anna Easter Brown. Um, but the, the ones after that are, are going to be fabulous. So we're going to try not to let this overcome all the work that the Downtown Alliance is doing. But we're excited about it. And it truly is one of those things that will drive traffic downtown. So that's our goal. Great. I'd just, just like to add that uh, the Anna Easter Brown marker, uh, we featured the dedication ceremonies on the TV show. Uh, so um, in the near future, uh, you can tune in, uh, tune in to Channel 30. 6 channel 45 and uh, catch the dedication ceremonies and uh, Megan said that we'd have dedication ceremonies and I have to say that we're going to be very hard pressed uh, to duplicate or replicate the Anna Easter Brown <laughs> dedication ceremony uh, because uh, they really set the benchmark very high for a dedication ceremony. Yes, uh, there uh, possibly will be CDs uh, uh, on the TV show. Uh, there was a condensed version. It was like 14 minutes of the uh, Anna Easter Brown dedication ceremony. But we will have CDs uh, that will be a full half hour uh, highlighting the complete ceremony that will be available in the near future. Is that correct, Tammy? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Madam Clerk, for our next presentation, I would like to call up the Johnson Diaz family uh, who's here. Up to the podium. That's not you, Gene. To the Nora Diaz family. There are many. <laughs> Hi, Marley. Hi. Let's get started here. Hello, Hawaii. Library director, Dave Cuby. Well, thank you for being here tonight, first of all. Thank you. Uh, not everyone in life uh, is blessed with the intuition uh, to uh, embrace social activism, really understand social activism, uh, and not only really understanding it, but embracing it in such a way that you try to accentuate change to build a better society in this world. 
And uh, tonight, I'm going to share with you an inspirational story of activism, social activism that has taken place here in, um, in our little community of West Orange. Marley Diaz is an 11-year-old student at Edison Middle School who grew tired of books that she has been assigned or she was assigned to read at school, explaining to her mother, Janice, that they were missing black lead characters. Her mother asked, what was she going to do about that? And Molly said she was going to start a book drive with the help and support of her mother and through the power of social media, Molly launched an impressive endeavor to collect 1,000 children's books which feature black girls as the lead character. Using the hashtag 1,000 black girl books, she has appeared at this point all over television, bringing attention to the social activism. Uh, I was just talking to a colleague of mine, Tiffany Alvarado from work, and she was telling me that she saw a YouTube video. It was a, 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 some sort of commercial. You know when you look something up, there's like a 15 second YouTube video with you on it, <laughs> talking about this initiative. It's just amazing. But through her efforts, Morley collected 700 books on her own, and she received donations from Stack Books and from Barnes and Nobles. She appeared on Ellen and was presented with a laptop and a $10,000 check from Shutterfly, which helped this impressive young lady to far exceed that goal that she originally intended. At this point, she has collected over 2,400 books to, to date and she has donated the majority of them to the retreat school in the parish of St. Mary in Jamaica where Janice grew up. Additional books are being donated to the Henry Lay School in Philadelphia, the Speedway Academies in Newark, and of course, our own St. Cloud Elementary School. The town council and my colleagues are proud of Marley and her social activism. And we want to thank her for her creativity, her drive, and your enthusiasm in initiating a movement which has touched so many people in such a short period of time. You should be proud of yourself. Thank you. And I got to tell you, from a personal perspective, I read uh, your story in the Star Ledger last month, and you inspired me as well. Mm -hmm. You inspired so many people in our community. Thank you for what you've done in uh, representing the family. So we're presenting Molly today with a citation on behalf of the, of the town council in West Orange. Congratulations again. Thank you. There you go. Dennis, would you like to say a few words? Oh, I'd rather she say <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Please, the forum is all yours. Right. Um, thank you so much for honoring our daughter. Um, this is, of course, um, all been more than spectacular. Um, it is wonderful to know that a little practice that started um, 11 years ago of making sure that our daughter read and that reading was a fundamental part of her life and that everyone understood that and embraced that um, has now taken hold of everything. It's also really important to us that, um, that people recognize what can happen when we listen to our children and um, providing opportunities for them to be able to share their thoughts and ideas. I had no idea this campaign would be so successful. In fact, I thought Maybe it would be marginal at best. I just wanted her to have the practice of moving away from complaining towards solution building. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she identified a problem. And um, I, it's really easy to describe problems. Um, but it's really much more important that we get ourselves into thinking about solutions. Um, and so to see that solutions can not only be really important for our own development, but has now been able to really transform the structural landscape of literacy and the need for inclusion and diversification of voices, that's a really big deal. 
Um, the other piece for us, um, and which I'm really thankful for the town, is that it's coming from the town in which we live. We've gone to a lot of places, and there's been a lot of different levels of recognition, but this is where we live, and this is where Marley and her dad and I have lived for the past eight years. So for you to take the opportunity to recognize us as citizens of the town and to um, honor her in this way, it makes West Orange a place that shows that it really does understand diversity. And lastly, I would say that this issue um, is framed around a hashtag 1000 black girl books, but this is clearly an issue that says that this is um, not just about black girls, but it is about inclusion and it's about representation of voices and it is about girls that we have to invest in our girls and we have to invest in all of our girls and hear their voices. So thank you again, West Orange, and thank you again. Well, thank you to all the authors that have donated books. Thank you to the West Orange Township Council. Thank you to St. Cloud Elementary. Thank you to Thomas Edison Middle School. Thank you to Kai and Amina. Thank you to Jackson and Arion. Thank you to Auntie Ie, Miss Lisa, and Miss Ali. <laughs> thank you to Mom and Dad, and definitely thank you. I'm getting a lot of practice on television these days. Congratulations again, and thank you for making West Orange proud. You should be proud. Good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Director Cuban, please. What a beautiful story. Thank you again for being at the council meeting. We're going to move on to uh, council liaison announcements. Uh, who would like to start? Sure. Colleagues? I have plenty. I have plenty. Um, let's see. We can start with next month, March 7th. The Rotary Club of West Orange presents Taste of the World on March 7th from 6 to 9 at Mayfair Farms. Tickets are $50. Net um, proceeds, benefit Rotary based projects, civic needs, both locally and internationally. College scholarships, disaster relief, heart surgery for children, Camp Mary Heart, uh, Polio Plus, and plenty more. You can purchase tickets at westorangerotary.org. Uh, March 7th. Picking up on where Mike, Megan left off on the Thomas Edison National Historic Park, the Friends of Edison, which is the fundraising arm for the National Park, are, they're having a Spring tune-up. This is going to be cars and cocktails at the Llewellyn Park Glenmont Garage um, on Thursday, May 19th from 5 to 7.30. Meet new and old friends, socialize in a historic setting, um, enjoy beer and wine, and we are going to experiment with a signature cocktail specifically for that night. Um, was interesting when you Google cars and cocktails, there are about 500 different cocktails that have car related names, so it will be an interesting experiment. The proceeds are to help conserve the gas pump in the Glenmont Garage, the electric, original electric car charging station, and other artifacts that are associated with the in and with the Glenmont Garage. You can purchase tickets at Friends of Edison, which is foedison at uh, dot org, foedison.org. And I just really want to say congratulations to Troop 2, Boy Scouts Troop 2, celebrating 100 years and oh, also nice. honoring an Eagle Scout coming up in March. And Troop 6, they just continue to honor and produce Eagle Scouts, and they have three coming up on March 12th. So congratulations to all the Scout, uh, the scout troops in town. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman yeah. Kathleen. Sure. Let me start with my... Uh, my new position with the, the Board of Ed liaison. liaison. Yes. 
So Thursday night, I attended the strategic planning meeting for the school district. It was the uh, third and last planning meeting, uh, which the goals and objectives were set for their five-year strategic plan. Uh, New Jersey School Boards did a, a wonderful job in organizing and um, getting the parents out. Um, the last meeting, they came up with uh, their goals of facilities and program accessibility, 21st century learning and readiness for future success, parent and community engagement, and holistic health and wellness. Uh, I was on, uh, in the facilities and program uh, uh, group, and uh, was interesting is the meeting before they had gathered a lot of data from the individual groups of what the residents and parents were concerned with. And one of the uh, 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 continued theme was from our last meeting with safety around the schools with the um, with parking and traffic. So, um, which will I know you'll, will be addressed, and uh, Councilman Garino will probably have that on his report today. Um, also, I uh, was invited over to Hayes Elementary for their Black History Month celebration. And whenever a principal at Acevedo asks you to come to one of his parties, you go because it's always a great time. Uh, the students did a great uh, job. They're very, very talented. Uh, Sunday, we were at a uh, Unico, and I'd like to oh, congratulate wow. um, Cynthia Cumming for her uh, receiving the Unico Award from them um, and being recognized this Sunday morning for all her hard work uh, for the food pantry here in the township. So, um, you know, kudos to her. She works very hard, and she's definitely one of an unsung hero when it comes to the time and dedication and feeding the hungry of West Orange. Um, now I'm going to switch gears to the PR Commission. Um, I like to oh, also being recognized were uh, two students from town, uh, Anthony Charles and uh, uh, and Sarah uh, Sarah um, Melendez. So congratulations to both of our students as well. Um, yesterday we had a great turnout. We had our we had our uh, residential realtor meeting at the Liberty Middle School of uh, the PR Commission. He was here. Uh, Tammy Williams is here on our committee. Susan Anderson, our uh, public information officer who steered this for us. Um, thank you to both of them. They did a wonderful job, Tammy and Krista Senek, uh, who are uh, realtors on our commission, did an excellent job. We had well over 70 realtors attend this event yesterday morning, which was unbelievable. Um, we like to thank the mayor and uh, Superintendent Rutsky for presenting at the event. Um, I, they were so engaged. They were just so excited to, to receive information and it always still amaze me as much as we have information out there that it's still not getting directed um, in certain places and that's something that we had a survey sheet um, that we're going to get data back on to work with them. Now we have a growing database for the realtors um, and then not just West Orange realtors, we're talking from other communities that they're going to come back. Uh, and Mr. Sayers, thank you for attending yesterday as well. Um, it was a really great event and hopefully we'll get great data from it and great support. Uh, we're looking, uh, we're happily working with the uh, Downtown Alliance Committee on planning a commercial realtor open house. Hopefully we'll target it for April. Uh, I know uh, Megan Brill is, is uh, working diligently to compile some information for us to get that going on. So I'm just gonna pass this to you so you could see what we gave out. We had a nice brochure uh, and a folder made out with information so when you get a chance if you wanna see what they, the information that they receive in the packet. So thank you to everyone who was involved. Uh, also, um, Meg, you also had mentioned with, with your report with uh, Edison, they also, it was, it was the week of strategic planning. Um, the museum had um, invited us to, um, which my colleague uh, Councilman Garino had attended as well, to uh, their strategic planning meeting. And that was very interesting to see uh, how they're gonna go move forward and all the exciting things coming out of the Edison Museum. And uh, we, we hope that they're going to partner with their, their new neighbor, so, um, and they'll be able to work together on some exciting events. So, also as well, the, you're also your own downtown alliance strategic planning meeting was very informative and eventful. And last but not least, 
tomorrow, uh, Thursday night, the, our uh, police officers are holding a meeting with our township clergy at 6.30 uh, p.m. at West Orange High School. That's everything I have. Thank you, Councilwoman. Before I, wanna, before I continue, I would like uh, us to check our calendars to see if March 12th is available. The administration has asked uh, to um, find out if that's a good date for everyone for the budget hearings. March 12th? Yes. It's a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Saturday. Uh, it is the boys' schedule. It's the boys' schedule. So just, uh, just give us feedback. Uh, we usually get here at 8.30. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we're here to like 4, 4.30. Mm -hmm. Do you need to know right now, Councilman? Um, not necessarily. We still have time. I mean, I'm okay right now. The sooner the better in terms of uh, scheduling. We expect to have the documents out to you this week. So uh, just let our clerk know if that doesn't work for you, and then we'll come up with an alternative date. Eagle starts at six. Oh, okay. I thought it was looking at yeah. Eagle starts yeah. at six. Okay. Eagle starts at six. So it's good. yeah, that's six o'clock. Yeah, so it's good. Councilman Koviak, you okay for that date? Yeah, unfortunately, I have to check multiple calendars. So <laughs> okay, so you you want to get back to us? Sure. sure. Terrific. Would you like to proceed with your uh, liaison report? Okay. Focus on that. The uh, West Orange Historic Preservation Commission met last week with uh, Congressman Rodney Frelinghuysen, five people from the congregation that's occupying what we generally know to be the St. Mark's uh, Church down here on Main Street, which suffered devastating damage from a fire uh, early on January 1st. Uh, the congregation the group included the pastor. Uh, other people attending it were two members of the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, two private architects who have spoken at previous council meetings, uh, Mr. Sayers, Chief Abbott, and construction official Tom Tracy. Uh, we all collectively brought the congressman up to speed and generally discussed next steps, including potential fundraising uh, to help fund the restoration of the church. After that, we took a tour of the property, and it was certainly very sad to see all the damage. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Jerry Eben, uh, who's in the audience, who is a member of the planning board and also the Downtown West Orange Alliance, who helped pull this meeting together, even though he uh, had to travel to be with the family in California and couldn't attend. He's, uh, like I said, he's in the audience tonight. He's the one that's coughing quite frequently. Uh, he's recovering from a bad cold, so I'm not sure if he's gonna speak tonight. So just in case he isn't, I just wanted to acknowledge him. Uh, also, uh, as a result of the meeting, I put the pastor's assistant in touch with Dave Drill, whose family owns the office building uh, next to Town Hall. Uh, he's also an officer in the Downtown West Orange Alliance. Uh, they're talking about using some of the space in, in that building for meetings. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge Mr. Drill also uh, for stepping up to help uh, a member of our community, the congregation in need. Uh, the church is looking for meeting space for about 25 people. So if anyone has any ideas or spaces that might work, uh, please contact me. Uh, we're looking to also invite other elected officials uh, to get them up to speed and also to gain their support. The uh, Historic Preservation Commission at its last meeting uh, reviewed the church's engineers' drawings for bracing the church walls in the start of uh, restoration of the property and uh, has provided written comments. And I just asked Mr. Sayers to uh, tell us perhaps where that stands and anything else going on uh, with St. Mark's Church from the point of view of the, of the uh, administration. Uh, Mr. Tracy has reviewed those plans and the comments and he has sent uh, a letter back to their engineer addressing those comments as well as his own comments and we're waiting to hear back from the engineer any timetable uh no i think he sent it out uh, i think he sent it out yesterday actually okay because uh just speaking for the historic preservation commission we're very uh anxious to get the uh the bracing up to make sure that the walls don't suffer any other damage and also to try to weather weatherproof them as well mm -hmm. and uh the hpc has just really continued continuing to focus on restoration of this uh, historic structure. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman? Oh, thank you, Council President. 
Uh, first of all, um, I'd like to make mention that you know, coming up on March 13th is our annual St. Patrick's Day Parade. And I would like to congratulate our Downtown West Orange Alliance Chairman, John McElroy, who is the Deputy Grand Marshal. So congratulations to Mr. McElroy, and uh, I'm sure he's proud of his Irish heritage, and uh, uh, we wish him much success. Um, also coming up, it's tomorrow night, but it's been on Facebook, it's been on all our notices, is our uh, Pedestrian Safety Complete Streets presentation at Liberty Middle School. Uh, starting at 7.30, we invite the whole community to come and see the fantastic award-winning presentation by the students and Professor Charles Brown of the Blaustein School of Government and uh, Urban Planning. So come by and see the great things that we have in store uh, for West Orange. Um, based on what my colleague, uh, Councilwoman Castellano said, we were at the National Park uh, meeting with the national representatives about their action plan. Uh, there'll be some great things coming to Main Street and to the museum based upon their strategy where they're coming in. Uh, the National Parks is going around and taking certain parks and doing what they call complete display boards, we're calling storyboards around the historic areas. And the one they just completed was a Kitty Hawk. And if you go on their website, the National Park Service, you see what they did for Kitty Hawk. As people and visitors go throughout the site, they actually get a complete story of how everything came along, the timing, the pictures, historic preservation, and what it looked like. The same thing will happen here in West Orange to the Edison site. Different parts along Main Street will show the Edison factory, the people who worked for Thomas Edison, the neighborhood, the whole history of the, of the park. So there's really exciting things at the National Park Service, particularly in their 100th anniversary. Uh, there's a lot going on. And uh, the Friends of Edison uh, that we belong to, well, there's a lot more activity. Of course, there will be the uh, cocktail party coming up, as Councilwoman uh, McCartney mentioned. So there's some real great things happening on Main Street, and my congratulations to the Downtown Alliance for its activity. I'm sorry about the farmer's market, but according to Ms. Brill, if another organization would like to try it, we'll be there to help them. We can give them some ideas and some guidance, and we'd support them. Uh, but I'm sorry that it's not going to go forward at this time, but we have to focus our, our, our resources in another direction. Um, getting back to pedestrian safety, we this past week we had our two meetings. We had the county-wide meeting uh, at uh, Turtle Bag Zoom. We thank the county executive and the, and the county of Essex for allowing us the access to the educational center at Turtle Bag Zoo with a fantastic uh, room that we can do our displays. Uh, our county meeting, which is the takeoff of uh, of six other towns that are copying West Orange, they've used us as an example. They are included the township of Nutley, uh, Bloomfield, Montclair, Verona, Glen Ridge. And the towns are coming together with us to see exactly what we've pulled together, and, and we're very proud of that. Uh, at our own pedestrian safety meeting the following evening, the pedestrian safety board, along with Professor Charles Brown from Rutgers University, we're completing and implementing our action plan, which should be available within the next two weeks. Um, everything we do at the Pedestrian Safety Board is now on the Township website. We have a web page, and the presentation that's going to be done tomorrow night will be on that web page, plus the action plan that we've pulled together. So there are exciting things that we're trying to do to make West Orange the safe street capital of the world, and we're really moving ahead. And according to Professor Brown, we are light years ahead of a lot of other communities. So uh, we're really proud of that also. And um, about that, thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilman Gorino. And uh, that concludes the uh, conference agenda for today. Thank you all. No. This is to inform the general public that this meeting is being held in compliance with Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975. A notice of this meeting was emailed to the Star Ledger and the West Orange Chronicle on October 14, 2015. A notice of this meeting was also posted on the bulletin board in the Municipal Building, West Orange, and filed in the office of the Municipal Clerk of the Township of West Orange on October 14, 2015. Councilwoman Castellino? Present. Councilman Garino? Present. Councilman Krakowiak? Present. Councilwoman McCartney? Present. Council President Cirillo? Present. Will everyone please rise yes. for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
The council is now in their public meeting. Thank you, Madam Clerk. It's uh, Tuesday, February 23rd, 2016, and welcome to our public meeting. Uh, tonight we'll start off with a uh, moment of silence uh, for uh, former Mayor Sam Spina, who passed uh, in between uh, meetings. Uh, we, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with the family, and uh, we really um, admire his contributions uh, to the municipality, uh, his many contributions, and his uh, long-term public service. Uh, God bless. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we will begin with public comment. Any member of the public wishes to address the town council this evening? Uh, yes, uh, ma'am, with the red dress. One second. <laughs> His name is Frank. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, Frank. <laughs> Frank, in <you know>, one second. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Ladies first, Frank. Good evening. Heidi Sawyer, 300 Gregory Avenue. I'm here tonight to make the council aware of a few issues that were not considered when the vote was taken for Ordinance 2474-16 on February 9th. This specifically concerns a plan to expand the Gregory School parking lot and to construct a bus loop in the front of the school. I'd like to address the parking lot expansion first. Inadequate faculty parking has existed for over 17 years. On a given day, 15 to 19 faculty cars are illegally parked. This makes it a challenging scenario for the three minibuses that arrive separately between 8.35 and 8.45 a.m. I agree that this is a safety issue. If the parking lot is expanded, it should continue to be for faculty only, not parents. Parents should be using the streets surrounding the school where there is ample legal parking if they plan ahead. The complaints regarding parking on Lowell Avenue directly behind the school as insufficient and unsafe are really the result of illegal parking. Need I remind my fellow residents that this area is for three minute parking only during school hours? There are street signs that clearly indicate this. On many occasions, I've seen parked cars on the street for an average of 10 minutes. In some cases, I've even seen parked cars with the ignition on without anyone behind the wheel. This morning, I observed two. Even today, there was a Board of Education minibus parked for a duration of 50 minutes today. Clearly, this is a behavioral issue that could be easily corrected through enforcement. The three-minute rule needs to be enforced, or a proposal for a kiss-and-go like that of Redwood School should be considered. A traffic officer needs to be present for the first few weeks of school to send a message that violations won't be tolerated. This would maintain a flow of traffic to free up spaces, especially when inclement weather increases car use. If the goal is to create 25 to 30 new parking spaces, how could this possibly happen with makeshift classroom trailers impeding any progress? The trailers have been on the Gregory School property for over 10 years. Is the township still in compliance with state law by having them there? Clearly, if the trailers are, were gone, the parking lot expansion would have happened years ago. Was there ever a plan to eventually offer our children better facilities for their classroom needs? Also, didn't the PTA and the Board of Education give any thought on how the placement of Centennial Plaza could potentially impede parking lot expansion? The circular driveway will exasperate an existing traffic problem on Gregory Avenue. Between 8.30 and 9 a.m., our cars back up. Uh, a car backup occurs when the crossing guard halts vehicles with the traffic light. When this happens, backups can sometimes go as far as Club Boulevard. If the large buses are relocated to the front, how will they be able to pull out southbound on Gregory Avenue with standing traffic in their way? I, as well as my neighbors, have never been able to safely exit our driveways during the aforementioned hours to go southbound on Gregory. Even when a motorist sees that we are attempting to exit, they never leave appropriate room when traffic is halted. Will these same motorists be courteous to the buses when they need to exit the school driveway during peak commuter time? For the general construction of both projects, are there schematics or general plans? If not, how did the council determine what it, that it, how did the council determine that an expenditure in excess of $357,000 would be needed? 
Has the council thought of the impact rainwater will have from runoff, which mo most likely will end up in the basements of the homes in front of the school? Will the town install an underground holding tank in the parking lot to prevent this? Holding tanks can be quite costly. What about catch, catch basins? Are they going to be installed? There are a lot of variables making the unseen costs of this project a financial burden once ground is broken. What guarantee do we have that the project will not exceed this amount once construction begins? The residents of this township should have been given the opportunity to vote on this project since it is a school project and a tax increase will be necessary to fund it. I am proposing that an engineering report and traffic study for Gregory Avenue be completed. The residents should be allowed to weigh in on whether the results of these reports, including schematics for the driveway and parking lot, are going to solve the old problems without creating new ones. One final note, I find it very curious that this motion was ever made, since a similar plan was proposed in 2007. The same exact problems I've mentioned existed back in 2007, and it was ultimately decided to discontinue pursuing a driveway for the front of the school because of the negative impact it could have to the neighborhood. It is my hope that the town council will once again tap onto their collective wisdom to consider reevaluating their decision from February 8th until more information is available for assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sawyer. Uh, Frank. Good evening. I am Frank Nicoletti in a brown sweater. <laughs> You're I'm the owner and resident of 3C2 Susan Court Eagle Rock Cooperatives. It's a pleasure to be here in the service of the members of our community, the town council, the office of our mayor, and of course our public library. As a retired director of curriculum and instruction, English, arts, humanities, and library media services, as well as a frequent, consistent, that is year-round patron of West Orange Public Library, I am, admittedly, alarmed by the potential impact of the budget that this year our library director was obliged to make in the face of insufficient funds. Diminishing, or more precisely, rapidly diminishing reserves behoove our library director to prepare a budget that it seems is $200,000 less than last year's. Such a budget will force reduction in library materials, programming, and no less unsettling, another reduction in staff. At least in this citizen's and retired educator's point of view, based on his interpretation of available data. What are the additional possible implications of such a constrained budget for the future, the near future, and the end of the upcoming cycle? One, to repeat, immediate staffing cuts will prove to be drastic. Two. Within three years, given the age of the HVA system, already 18 years in a professionally estimated life cycle of 20 years, it will be beyond the ability of the library to replace it and to restore the collapsed library facade. Three, by year five, our West Orange Public Library will be unable to restore a roof that by then may well be necessary to replace. Like everyone in this room and all responsible citizens, I too recognize the reality of a budget constraint that stretches across the nation in both public and private sector institutions. 
However, I close and reflect now and finally on a sobering statistic to wit of 10 New Jersey libraries that serve comparable communities, West Orange already employs the lowest number of staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Anyone else? Yes. What? She uh, raised her hand first. Uh, Dave. Lisa. Hello, my name is uh, Lisa Muckle. I live at 296 Gregory Avenue. And I also would like to speak to you regarding the Gregory Avenue parking situation. Um, I have some concern about why the town is bonding this project mm -hmm. instead of the school. The BOE has the authority to issue bonds. And they've also known that this has been a problem for 15 years at least, the parking situation. They should have been physically responsible and saving money or put it in their own capital budget as opposed to having the town pay for it. This being said, the expansion of the parking area is necessary, but I'm not sure that this, how this is going to be completed. I'm assuming the playground and now the new park will have to be removed to add 20 parking spots. The town is giving BOE funding without a plan in place. If the town was going to give the BOE funding for a parking driveway, the council should have waited until the BOE expended funds for a traffic study, environmental review, and some sort of specs. The council voted without seeing any actual plans, which I believe is not in the best interest. The council's job is to protect the interest of all taxpayers, and in this case, it is not. I understand child safety is a very big important issue here, but you don't even know what they're going to do is going to be in, accomplish that. Of major concern is the driveway in the front of the school. There are many questions to be answered with regards to the driveway that is being discussed. Where will it be installed, with or without parking? How will the children now enter the school? Currently they have an area in the back to line up, they go right into the school. Will the trees all be removed from the front of the school? You know, at, I was initially told no, but how can you get two lanes and parking in the front of the school without really taking apart the whole facade uh, front area of the school? They're also adding two new driveway cuts. Will new crossing guards need to be hired to cross pedestrians, children across these driveway cuts? It goes back to the question about the specs. Is there a plan drawn on the back of a napkin somewhere that shows what the BOE anticipates to be done and how it'll affect the area? Living on Gregory, I can tell you the morning traffic is a big issue. You all should really come up there in the morning, especially on a rainy day, and see how traffic is impacted. Parents drop their kids off in front of the school, which is illegal, but they, they double park in front of the school and let their kids out. There's just too much traffic to add another two cuts of buses coming out and buses coming back onto the road. The traffic study was done almost 20 years ago and the county noted that this wasn't really a feasible thing to do. 10 years ago, when I first moved in, it came up again. And again, it was determined that it really wasn't a good idea. You're putting children on a main street. You know, you don't know what a kid is going to do, especially a young child. Which way are they gonna go? Which way are they gonna run? Which way are they gonna be directed? During the morning, Gregory backs up for blocks all the way past winding way when the crossing guard utilizes the light which makes a four-way red. This is what is needed to cross the children. However, but it throws off the traffic flow in the morning. Many times, residents along Gregory need to exit their driveways in the other direction and go around the block. This traffic also will impact the timely arrival of buses. There are too many questions that need to be answered before the council hands over the money. The BOE needs to take a look at many things before it starts making changes in the school area. Traffic and environmental impact of the school's neighbors need to be addressed. They need to be a good neighbor to those who live around it. Did the council even question why the BOA has not removed the temporary trailers and used that space for parking and a driveway that would keep the children off the main road? In the scheme of things, the town bonding for another $375,000, it's a drop in the bucket, but it shouldn't be the town's bucket, it should be the BOE's bucket. 
And once the plans are all in place, what will the town, you know, does the town have the final say in what they give you? You, you can change your mind and say, we're not giving you the rest of the money. And is there more money to give them if they come back and say it's $500,000? Are you gonna do another bond issuance? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's too many questions for you to just say, here's the money. There should have been a lot of answers and the BOE should have put up some of the money and did all the reports first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, we absolutely will take all that feedback into consideration that when this matter comes up for uh, actual funding. Anyone else? Yes. Library director? Dave Kuby, library director. <coughs> and I am just here to inform the public of some positive things at the library. Uh, this Thursday <laughs> is our board meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, we too have completed a strategic plan which will be presented to the board of directors by uh, consultants Jim Hecht and Ann Roman. You may recall Jim was the interim director for six months, I believe, prior to me coming here. Um, March 1st, uh, there's going to be a book discussion, The Invention of Wings by Sue Monk Kidd from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Uh, March 4th, uh, and every first and third Friday we have film and dessert, so March 4th, the film will be the second best exotic Marigold Hotel. Uh, join us for some cookies and coffee and tea. Um, this is the time if you have children to enroll in story time for spring story time hours, uh, please you can come into the library or you can go to our website www.wopl.org to sign your children up or you can call the library uh, for Dr. Seuss's birthday, Wednesday, March 2nd at 4 p.m. And uh, Saturday, March 5th from 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, we will be celebrating that with the high school ESL club will be coming in. Um, we'll be doing that. Uh, um, this month in March will be the New Jersey Makers Day coming up. And... That is what we have going on right now. Tonight there was a very successful STEAM program that had over 20 kids that were there, which was a really great thing. Kids in the middle school area, get them interested in the areas of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Uh, and of course, it was wonderful to have Alpha Kappa Alpha at the library for the Anna Easter Brown. I wasn't here at the last council meeting, but it was a really wonderful event. And it was so wonderful to have Marley here, Marley Dias here, as kind of a bookend between uh, more than 100 years ago and showing West Orange's commitment and investment to education and the community for all the residents. And you can see the results. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Steve. Yes, Mr. Marwitz. Two microphones. Good evening, Mark Meyer, which 19 Howell Drive. Uh, St. Mark's Church unfortunately had the fire not too long ago, and it's wonderful to see that there's already action being taken. Uh, so I guess when things, when the township wants things to move forward quickly, it has the ability to do that. So that's that's a great sign. Unfortunately, we can't say the same thing about the downtown redevelopment, which seems to be. Uh, stalled in perpetuity. Um, I read the resolutions. They were emailed to me just today, so I didn't have a chance to go over them. Resol the resolution for 71 slash 16 and 72 slash 16. And they really make no sense at all to me. They're, they're really, they seem written in gobbledygook. Um, it seems that uh, the project can be extended to the first stage. Completion date can be extended from 2017 to 2019. There were some other things that were very vague. 
uh, that were open to interpretation. And uh, what I would hope to avoid is a situation like we had from last summer, when in August the attorneys told us, well, if you pass this resolution or this law, whatever it is you call it, then Dune and Prism will be ready to go and good to go. And then two or three months later, lo and behold, the attorneys came back and said, oh, that's not what we said. You know. So, so we don't want, I don't want to see another situation like that. So if there could be some kind of presentation about these two resolutions in clear, simple, plain English, and I would take what the lawyers had written and that was posted today on the website or whatever it was that I saw, and I would throw it out and just write in plain, simple English what this is attempting to do. Because the public has the right to understand what, what is going on, and the council has the right to understand what is going on, and I don't think anyone, on, unless you're you know, super lawyer or super somebody, I don't think anyone can understand those resolutions. They were such written roundabout vague ways. So please, you know, instruct them to, to do a good job in English. If you want, I'll volunteer and I'll, I can write it in English, you know, so you can understand it. And there's also some other things like on the bottom here, there's a new name that I'm not familiar with, DGP Urban Renewal. Anybody know who they are? Yeah, okay. That's okay. I'm glad someone knows who they are, because I haven't heard of them, you know. And uh, you know, let's let's get to plain back to plain English, so the people of the township who are, you know, uh, underwriting tax breaks for the developers can understand what's going on in this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Marowitz. Yes, sir. Council members, residents of West Orange. Can you state your name and address, please? Yes. I'm Drew Sawyer. I live at 300 Gregory Avenue, just opposite Gregory School. And I want to talk tonight about the expansion of the parking lot of Gregory School, the north parking lot, and also uh, the proposed bus driveway to go into the front of the school. There's no question that the parking lot capacity is an issue. It's been that way for quite some time. Um, but it's my understanding that microbuses are actually dropping off students in that parking lot. And I don't think that's really what that parking lot is intended for. That's creating additional parking problems. Um, and I understand there are some safety issues uh, with that. This activity needs to cease. Unless that parking lot uh, in its expansion is adequately designed for a drop off area, uh, then this needs to cease. As far as the expansion is concerned, um, if it comes down to it, the trailers need to be removed in order to make space to uh, have enough real estate to expand that parking lot. Um, they've had a good life. They've been there for 10 years. It was a temporary solution. Uh, but we need to come up with a more permanent solution. Right now, they represent a very inefficient single-story use of space. I would rather see that footprint reduced horizontally and expanded vertically so that there is more sufficient room for parking. A more permanent structure needs to be erected in my opinion and that would be a better use of this funding. Um, it's my understanding that these trailers are illegal. I'd also like to talk about uh, the bus driveway in the front of the school. Simply stated, the volume of traffic on Gregory Avenue during the drop-off period is just too great to make this a practical solution. The school is located very close to a corner. There isn't uh, adequate clearance for the buses to enter or exit a pull-in area. And even if there were, they would be fighting uh, for attention with cars. And I can see cars uh, and buses trying to get out onto Gregory Avenue at great risk to students who may be attempting to cross in front of them. Any student activity near that county road uh, puts the student safety at risk. On a road that is prone to accidents, just three in the past year, including uh, invo uh, involving one overturned vehicle in a 25 mile an hour zone. 
It's also important to consider how this will risk, could be a risk to the township of West Orange in terms of possible litigation for any kind of property damage or water damage caused by runoff um, should this upset the water table. On October 2015, I did my own personal traffic study. And during that study, I found that there were parents who were illegally parked, uh, not in their cars, for greater than the three minute cutoff period um, in the area uh, on Lowell Avenue where the drop off zone is for the cars. Some of those cars pulled into the bus area, which is approximately three buses long. But other than that, there were no real infractions. There was no real problem with that area. Buses would pull in. There were only ever two buses uh, at any given time. The, last, the first bus arrived at 8.31. The last bus arrived at, uh, departed rather at 8.45. The average length of a bus stay was three minutes and 18 seconds. And typically, buses would pull into the first space. A bus would pull behind it. That bus, bus would pull out. Um, there were a total number of three cars which pulled into the bus zone, even though there were parking spaces available. So clearly, um, parents need to be educated as to what the flow is. So I reiterate that there should be a police officer posted at the beginning of school to um, make the parents aware that this sort of behavior is not going to be tolerated. Uh, in general, this is just something that's very serious and we need to consider this very ser seriously. We need to do the analysis on it. We need to understand what the implications of it will be uh, in both the safety and the budget. And um, if there's any assistance I could provide, I would be happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. And uh, before we proceed, uh, I just want to explain the policy process uh, that applies in this case and any other case that utilizes bonding as a form of financing. Uh, we are the legislative branch, so an independent cost estimate is generated uh, by the administration. They come up with a number that they would feel would be sufficient to fund the improvements. This body authorizes the administration to uh, issue those bonds uh, or extends the bonding authority to the administration. The administration issues the bonds. Once the financing is available, uh, professional services are then uh, 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 go procured uh, through a competitive process as well as the uh, construction of the improvement. So we, we, as a legislative body, we still have some say uh, in the process as we are currently in the middle of that policy process. So this feedback to us is a very, very, very good feedback, uh, necessary in order for us to move the, the ball along, the process along, and make, to make sure that anyone that's being affected by this policy issue, uh, is, uh, their, their concerns are being uh, addressed uh, or considered. So that's the policy process as it relates to, to this issue. Uh, Rosary Morelli, who's next? We always have two of these here. This is new. Rosary Morelli, Ralph Road. Uh, tonight I'd like to address three issues. The Gregory School issue, tonight's meeting procedure, <clears throat> excuse me, and PRISM. Uh, on the Gregory School issue, at the last meeting my comments focused on the shared facilities interlocal agreement, the bonding for the construction work to be done to alleviate what were described as unsafe and hazardous situations in the area. Since then, I've learned more about the problems, especially those that could directly affect the nearby residents. One that the construction could cause potential flooding, along with numerous other negative impacts and considerations previously mentioned here tonight by the speakers. Now, with tonight's meeting procedure, what's the proposed format for Ms. Credito's comments if she speaks, if she plans to speak to the public regarding the two PRISM agenda items, resolutions 71-16 and 72-16. 
Will she read, and I have to tell you this, I didn't speak to Mark today at all. So apparently I'm reinforced in my feelings here. Will she be, read both resolutions and explain them in language that can be comprehended by the citizens of the township? That is, those of us who do not have law degrees nor did not pass the bar. Many of my fellow citizens and I would deeply appreciate a formal presentation and a question and answer period. At the very least, we're owed that consideration and courtesy. Uh, I suggest what we must have is more specificity. The lack of specifics was so evident when we had what was alleged to be the beginning, we had witnessed or allegedly witnessed the beginning of construction in September and had so many people asking, what's happening? Has construction started? And the answer we got was PSENG was on site. That's not specific. An example of a few things I don't understand on tonight's resolution are on the exhibit D construction schedule. Um, this is the replacement paragraph. Unless otherwise told or adjusted as provided for in this agreement, commencement of construction of phase one project will commence within 30 days of the date hereof and completion of construction of phase one project will take place by February 1, 2019. I think I just heard Mark mention, I think previously it was 2017. Uh, I don't know what told, T-O-L-L-E-D, means, and I googled it, couldn't find anything that explained it that I could understand it. What date is date here of? Is that the date when this is signed off on? Uh, who determines that the construction is complete? How does that whole process work? We don't know really when it will start or specifically what has to be done, be considered the beginning. How will we know that it's absolutely complete? We the people need to know, and I am asking you please have a formal presentation with a question and answer period. Thank you. Rosary, you mentioned that you wanted to speak about PRISM. You still have time. You, that was it? That was it? Oh, okay. Yeah, you still have time. <laughs> <laughs> You could, okay. you could bank it. <laughs> Thank you, and yes, uh, those are all questions that uh, our council uh, has, uh, has asked of our professionals and they will be addressed. Uh, next speaker, yes. Council President, members of the council, good evening. First, I would like to thank Your the name council. And address, please. Excuse me, Your name Kevin Malanga, Ridge Road. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the council for its support of the West Orange Trap, Neuter, Vaccinate and Release Program. Uh, I know that the members of the council took a lot of time to educate themselves as to the importance of this program to learn the details. And I do appreciate that every single one of you took that time and I'm grateful that. Uh, Mr. Guarino, I'd like to thank you for your strong support on this. Uh, you, were, you said that you were going to support it, you kept your word, and I'm grateful for that. And also, I would like to thank Mr. Kayser. Mr. Kayser provided many hours of work on this ordinance. I'm grateful for the support on that. He and I had many conversations, and he was also entirely supportive. So I, I thank Mr. Kayser, members of the council, as for tonight's presentation with respect to PRISM, I've spoken about that before. I've been concerned about the downtown redevelopment project since inception for 10 years or more. And I'm especially concerned about the lack of clarity, lack of transparency, lack of understanding as to the township's affordable housing obligation pursuant to this project. Originally, the downtown redevelopment project called for 71 affordable housing units to be constructed. Those 71 units were maintained through the various iterations of the agreements with PRISM. Then suddenly, we have this new agreement with Dune. There's no affordable housing component. That seems to be now undertaken by phase two or subsequent phases of this project 
that remain with PRISM. That makes me concerned that this obligation, that is the township's obligation. So if the developer doesn't build it, the town has to. The town has to lay out the money for that. Each unit could be $200,000 or more. That was the estimate from the very original agreement in 2006. So can we have an understanding as to who is going to be paid for this? Because clearly, PRISM is an insolvent developer. They have not the wherewithal to complete this project. They will not have the wherewithal to complete the affordable housing component of this project. Let's address it. Let's be open about that. Let's really know how much this project is going to cost us. And the same goes for the, what I've called the tax abatement. Members of the uh, PRISM team have objected to that. We'll call it the tax reduction, uh, the tax incentive, whatever you want to call it. Let's have a number as to how much in tax revenue the township is foregoing as a result of this agreement, es especially since we've heard about the library being asked to reduce its services. Other departments are being asked to reduce the services. Uh, I understand that the township has a $5 million budget deficit that has to be made up. So if we are going to be losing revenue, let's be clear about that. What is this going to cost us in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malanga, for that uh, insightful information. Anyone else from the public? Yes, uh, you feeling up for it? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're risking him. <laughs> he's not doing well, but he's here. Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, Jerry Eben, 26 Walker Road. Um, uh, you'll excuse my head cold. Uh, you can just imagine what it's like being on a plane that's landing when you have a head cold like this. Um, you heard screaming all the way down, it was me. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilman uh, Krakowiak and Business Administrator Sayers for coordinating the meeting last week, or this past week, with uh, Congressman Feelingheisen while I was away uh, visiting my very cute grandchildren in California. I have to get the very cute in there. Uh, I'm extremely pleased that the councilman and the administration can work together for what I would like to state is one of one of the most important tasks in front of this community, saving St. Mark's Church. There are many tasks in front of this community, uh, but that's one. I also want to thank my colleagues, excuse me a minute, uh, Robert Cazzarelli, AIA, who is an AIA New Jersey regional representative to the National AIA, and Eli Goldstein, AIA, who you're more familiar with, uh, who from my first call to him days after the fire has been there to support me with his expertise in historic architecture and his special emphasis in what is known as heavy timber construction. I think I can speak here for many architects in our, in our community uh, that we have felt that there is a fiduciary responsibility to the public good that in fact architects are accountable during the lifetime of the building. Um, and I think it's been presented here on previous council meetings and reported uh, uh, correctly in the Chronicle that as architects, we have started to leverage our actual value. Uh, as members of the council and the administration, not to mention the public at large, we are seeing a change in our perceived value as long as, as a longtime enthusiastic leader of my profession, with, unparall with unparalleled integrity, I remain fully engaged in the goal of saving this iconic structure and hope that all of you will join me in this goal. Over the many occasions uh, of over now 40 years of living in uh, West Orange, I've appeared before many council meetings to speak on the value of securing the right architect for the task at hand. We need a second report on this building. We need a plan that works to shore this building. Um, Mr. Sayers spoke of the fact that, the, that Tom issued a report. I would hope that he would share that report with the council um, and, and the Historic Preservation Commission at the very least. If he wants, he can send me a copy as well. Uh, and I'll look it over uh, free of charge, no, no, no charge at all. Um, on these occasions that I've spoken about solving problems, as an architect, I'm trained to do just that and I do it in creative ways. So I would like to focus for a short time that I have on the Gregory School parking lot. Uh, the people that came up here this evening are younger, much younger than me, and they talked about the problem being there about 17 years. Well, the problem is 
well over 30 years old. And in fact, in 1987, I came up with a solution when I served as the PTA co-president of Gregory School. I think I was the first male PTA president at the time. Uh, my, my proposal never was implemented, and now all of a sudden there's a rush to spend upwards of $357,000. I think there's a, there are better ways to solve this problem than taking down old growth trees, making more paved areas, and thereby creating more storm water run runoff. I would strongly suggest that before you go forward in that direction that the school administrators and the neighbors who, some of whom appeared here tonight, uh, who are directly affected, sit down and look for other solutions. There are other solutions to the problem. I would be more than happy to offer my expertise in problem solving to any group of concerned citizens with the goal to solve the problem and most certainly at a lot less cost of $375,000. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Jerry. I hope you feel better. Thank you. Thomas, Thomas, stop flying. That's where he got the call. Too much flying. Too much flying, Jerry. What? Too much flying. Too much flying. Exactly. Anyone else wishing to address the council? Anthony. Hi, Anthony Puglisi, representing County Executive Joe DiVincenzo. Uh, I know it's only February, but I just want to uh, bring your attention to one date that's approaching, and that's our Cherry Blossom Festival. It's one of the largest events that we have, uh, and one of the first events is the 10K run. In front of you, I placed some of our um, literature and registration for that. I also placed some registration booklets on your information table outside. and. Um, also, that information is available on our website, which is EssexCountyNJ.org. Uh, the 10K run is Sunday, April 10th uh, in Branchwood Park, and we do invite everyone to um, come out if you're not a runner. I'm not a runner, but I do go out and I watch the runners. It makes me feel better. <laughs> uh, it doesn't get me in shape, but it makes me feel better. Uh, and of course, as more information comes up uh, about the festival, I will make you aware of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for the update, Anthony. Anyone else wishing to address the council? Yes, sir. Good evening. Name and address. I am Sello Kumar from uh, 304 <coughs> Gregory Avenue. I, I live in West Island nearly um, 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was watching all this uh, traffic, and I just want to mention a few things. Um, in, in that area, uh, I noticed few times the water main break happened. I don't know whether it's fixed properly or not. This is sleeping thing over there. So um, how that's going to affect all this construction has to be considered. Uh, next thing I want to mention is uh, <coughs> um, the, the area is, is so far, is so much traffic flowing. And this has to be some kind of regulation. Already other people mentioned these things. Uh, and, uh, if, you, if the traffic is blocked, in, I mean, nowadays there are so many things happening in the school. How this emergency uh, people will arrive in the school if this um, plan is implemented? Say, for example, something, they have to reach the school quickly from different directions to handle some situation in the school, because you are seeing all these uh, Connecticut school and other schools, things are happening. For this school, any plan they have, if they implement this new uh, uh, driveway or other things. Just I want to mention this. Thank you for the council. Thank you for your feedback. Anyone else? Seeing none, colleagues, councilwoman? Do you want me to start on this? Me Who's to ready to address the public? <laughs> I'm good with Gregory if you want me to. Okay. Take that. It's up to you if you want to. Okay. I really, I, I appreciate all the comments uh, that came in uh, on Gregory and uh, I served with Jerry Eben as a PTA president uh, 30 years ago as well. 
So we have been discussing this for a very long time. Um, I, it, just like planning board applications, uh, according to our township engineer, professionals do still have to be hired for this project. Everything you mentioned, of course, would be addressed in that plan um, in any of those surveys. I think our council president summed up a lot about authorizing the funds to move forward with this. Um, and there's still a lot, a lot of work to be done. Um, and I really can just say I appreciate the fact that you did come out to address those uh, concerns. And it, it isn't really anything new um, that our engineer doesn't, w won't, or uh, address when that time comes. So um, appreciate your comments. I think everything, I, and I wanted to say to Mark, Rosary, everyone about the uh, resolutions that are on the uh, agenda this evening. It, we had the same concerns, which is why there was a conference call and um, information and bullet points sent to us about the redevelopment resolutions. Because on the one hand, the 72-16 resolution had a lot of narrative involved in it that explained um, the resolution and the first one we felt the original redevelopment agreement goes back to 2006 and we need it, we want it we have presentation scheduled for this evening and to bring everyone forward with us so uh, that will be spelled out in plain English as uh, has been requested and I think we'll hear that when the, when the professionals speak so we felt the same way, and uh, thank you for those comments. I think that that, that was the bulk of it, right? And then there's some budget what? issues. I don't and know if you want to Frank, speak about yeah, that. Yeah, Frank. I really thought you were going to come up and talk about the West Orange Arts Council. <laughs> I forgot about that in the liaison uh, comments that there was a wonderful uh, tribute to George Tarr. Monza and um, former chair of the West Orange Arts Bill Council, Bill Cafone, yeah. on Sunday with their exhibit. And the gallery is doing so well. And now workshops, everything that they have been talking about for so long, now they have a home and a place and um, right there on Valley Road. So between Pink Cupcakes and Luna Stage, uh, it looks like a great area for art and design. That's what I thought you were going to talk about. Um, and the library, you know, we just said at the start of our meeting, we do have a budget meeting come, we're yeah. planning on March 12th. Um, it's a very sensitive subject um, that I know we're going to have to hash out. So. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilwoman. Councilwoman Castellina. Okay. Um, yeah, let me see if I can shed a little light for the Gregory residents. First of all, thank you for, very much for coming down. Okay. And I'm a little bit disappointed that you weren't brought into the fold to be in the planning meeting for the, for the uh, bus loop that will uh, be across the street from you. Um, I don't know, um, you know, the superintendent might have been remiss not realizing to, to reach out to the, to the um, residents right across the street. I don't think it was done intentionally. I just, you know, maybe he, 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 just, uh, he just didn't think about that, and that's unfortunate. Um, however, I know they did have a lot, of plan a, a lot of planning for this. This happened, I was on the school board set for 10 years. I came over in September. Uh, prior to me leaving, they were working on this. Um, you go back to 2007. It was a different plan. That plan was cutting into, it was kind of making the front, um, the front of the school, the lawn, actually making another lane into the property. So the county had some issues with it, and there was a whole lot of issues with it. I, at, at the time, I wasn't comfortable with that plan as well. Um, ideally, the trailers definitely need to go. The reason why they're still there every year, they get them recertified. And we're not the only um, school district in the state of New Jersey that has these issues with the trailers. Many other districts still have the trailers because um, bond referendum, you would have to go out to get um, another addition to, for the overcrowding. Um, there were some plans in place. I'm trying to give you the, the, the short 
story because I could talk for a long time and I know we have two ordinances that are going to need a lot of time this evening and you know you feel free to always reach out to me um, but basically um, the ideal plan would have been to remove the trailers move back their playground and expand that parking lot back there also the also to look at putting a if you have ever been up to Pleasantdale school they took their bus loop and put it behind the school but they have the room unfortunately they looked at that at Gregory and they it just wasn't going to happen there it, it, it just wasn't um, working out um, and the trailers we looked at two plans uh, when I was on the school board trying to move the preschool program out of Pleasantdale school to reconfigure and and redistrict the entire school district um, looked at so many other different plans so it, this wasn't just how can I put it? This, this, this just wasn't just a quick plan, a quick fix. It was, it was something that I, I think was kind of like they had to resolve it, and this was um, the best solution for now, uh, because those trailers will be there still for quite some time. Um, however, the good news is um, the principal, the superintendent, the entire uh, staff at Gregory, uh, we'll be working hard on a plan. Uh, we had the same similar situations over at Redwood School. They made, they created a kiss and go lane. Basically, what you're going to have is a bus loop. I didn't see the final plans. They had three different versions. They're trying to make the best plan fit, but they're going to have a bus loop that goes goes through. And you need to sit with the school board because right, it's their property, and they're going to have the final say of what they put in. So I would highly recommend and suggest I'm going to let the superintendent know you reached out so he could contact you to maybe give you a few more details on what exactly their proposed plan uh, is because it's their plan even though we uh, help them with the bond they are going to um, actually decide what works best for their property um, you mentioned micro buses the reason why they're there those are special education buses it's a mandate we have to uh, tr transport our special education students and we have a few special education programs at Gregory School um, the buses will come in on a schedule. It's not going to be all buses there first thing in the morning. The parents will utilize Lowell Avenue now for the drop off. Teachers will be out there all over like they are now, but um, they'll be directing the kids in from the back of the school. So hopefully that will alleviate. Th there is a plan. I don't know exactly what their plan is, but there will be a plan. I highly recommend that we get you together to speak with the superintendent and the school officials and you could express your concerns to them so they could be mindful when formulating their plan and your input could be, could be heard. But uh, I, I really apologize. I wish that you were in the initial talks, but I think in the long run, this will be a good solution for you as well. I know hearing about it sounds uh, alarming and I don't blame you, but I think once they finalize everything and you have a seat at the table and you give them your input, I, I, I think you'll be fine. As far as the water concerns and whatnot, I don't blame you for worrying about that, but I know they had engineers look at this and, and all that was calculated in. So again, um, we'll, we'll get a meeting brokered so you could speak with the school officials. Um, and, and thank you very much for coming down and, and expressing your concerns because you know it's, it's your value of your property. And I know it's a nightmare now, but I, I truly think it's gonna, it's, it's gonna work out better for you. Um, Let's see here. Um, I look forward to the discussion on the um, on the two ordinances. Um, and I, Mr. Myers, Ms. Morelli, uh, I, I too, you know, I'm I'm in the uh, real estate business. Uh, reading the documents, I had some concerns. I had some questions, and um, I, I want to thank the administration for setting up our um, conference calls with uh, Ms. Credidio. And thank you very much. Um, I kept you on the phone call quite some time, called you back a couple more times, really getting my head wrapped around it. And, um, and we had that discussion, if you tonight could articulate to the public on kind of the points I was, you know, was making. And uh, you know, I'm new to this project. I want to commend my colleagues for dealing with this issue <laughs> for the past <laughs> ten, years. <laughs> 10 years and being wrapped up in all the paperwork because trying to, you know, fall for myself coming in and following the chain of documents leading to, to this evening. But um, that's all I'll say about that for now. And uh, hopefully we'll 
we'll all have clarity when we all walk out this evening. And uh, Frank, I'm sorry I missed your, your um, event this weekend. I was down in, uh, in Westminster at uh, League of Municipal Municipality School uh, learning about the municipal budget. So I was in a, I was in a good place. Um, and the library, I look forward to the conversation when we meet on the 12th, if we're meeting on the 12th. Councilman. Yes, thank you, Councilwoman. One more thing, sorry. Mayor, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, out of turn. Just going back to the Gregory, because the Sawyers, Jack, and I think that this is something we can address immediately. When the Sawyers brought up about the three minute parking, um, there is an enforcement yeah. issues going on also there. If there are signs already about the three minute parking and then cars just being parked. And we also have idling ordinances. So those are things that we can address right now immediately. Thank you, sorry. Thank you, Susan. Councilman Gorina. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Frank, thank you very much for your words tonight about the library. You know, we're all concerned. You know, it's an important asset for the township, especially our young people. It's something that we need to address and something that we will, you know, as our budget meetings come up. And thank you. It's good to have citizens like you who are, are really concerned about other aspects of the community. And uh, we thank you for your words and an update. Uh, to the Gregory parents, I'm, I'm glad you came tonight. We want your input. We appreciate your concerns and how you think it should be addressed. And of course, like my colleagues have said, you know, this is not, you know, way it's going to be laid out. There'll be professionals. Uh, getting involved with the final plan by the Board of Education because it is their property and your input will be very well appreciated and so basically going forward like I said you'll be surprised and it's just the, how it's going to be laid out and once you see how it's going to be laid out when everybody's comfortable I think at the end of the day you'll find it's a win-win like many of you said that you know we represent all the town and we do and we're responsible to every and including our children and making it a safe environment for our children and that's what we look to do. Nothing other than that is to make it a safe environment for our children. Uh, going back, the first and original plan for this was not a driveway and a, and, a, and a cut through. It was basically a curb cut. And that's when, you know, that was going to be a problem where they're just going to make a second lane on Gregory Avenue and then you'd have the buses park in there. This is a totally different concept. But we want to hear your input. We appreciate it. And we're going to make you part of that. And as the council president said, you know, as it comes through and all the agreements come through, there are professionals who need to be addressed and need to be advised. So it's, it's an important thing and you need to let us know. And, and, and that's it. Um, with the development, of course, and I mean, Mr. Malanga finds it confusing too. Imagine people who don't have the legal background and the legal mind to look at the documents. And, and we want it to be as clear as possible because once all the he said, she said, he says, and are, are all laid out in plain English, everybody will have a better comfort level with the development and how it's being laid out and, and the documents and the wording. And, and Ms. Cudenio was very helpful in, in the conference call in explaining questions that we've had. And so it, it, it's very helpful to have the plain English and, and the and explanation. At the end of the day, it, it, it's a win-win for the, for the community. Um, uh, other, with with uh, Mr. Even, you know, your dedication to historic preservation and, and, and St. Mark's is commendable. And of course, you know, Mr. Cazzarelli is a national member of the AIA and knowing that possibly maybe the AIA could help us with it. There, there is national funding that AIA has at its disposal and hopefully uh, with his courtship of the AIA and, and his presentation on our needs for St. Mark's, maybe they'll take it, because with Upjohn, I mean, you know, the AIA and Upjohn, you know, the architect who developed, and two churches in, in West Orange that are important to, to look at. So hopefully, you know, your colleagues in the AIA will be able to assist us, and, and, and we appreciate that. And, um, you know, it, it's good things. You know, it's important. We're not just going to let it go. But we need to know the real aspects, a good study. And like I said last time, if you were problems with the original study, <laughs> somebody should ask for their money back. I mean, that's, uh, that's it. But uh, thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Kowiak. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to all the local residents around Gregory School who came to speak tonight. And uh, I'm uh, just very surprised that we didn't hear any of the uh, comments, the facts that you brought forward going back to 2007 while we were discussing uh, how we were going to handle uh, this situation. 
Uh, I agree that if there's illegal parking and if there's illegality going on Lowell, and it sounds like to some extent putting the kids at risk, we do need enforcement up there. So I hope we get some regular enforcement up there uh, because this is because this, this is going to continue to go on. Yeah, maybe if you could just get us, give us a report going forward on how many tickets are written or how many uh, uh, warnings are given, uh, how to fix that. Because uh, if that is indeed true, that we could fix the problem, much of the problem, by just enforcing uh, the rules up there on Lowell, it would uh, save a ton of money and a, uh, a ton of uh, consternation uh, of local residents. Um, I, too, am surprised that you weren't asked to join in this group because at the last council meeting we heard that the school itself had put together a, a working group going back a long ways and you've heard more up here about uh, other members of the the school uh, district who've been helping to put this together and uh, I think the local residents need a voice in this going forward. You, we've identified uh, a lot of the issues tonight, and one of the issues is that you guys have not been able to uh, provide input. If there's a, a working group out there that's been existing for a long time, you guys need to be members of it going forward and providing your, your input. So I would uh, like to recommend that and hear back whether that actually is going to uh, take place. Uh, you guys have made a lot, of, uh, a lot of good points and raised a lot of concerns uh, that certainly need to be addressed. I know I've been going back and forth with Mr. Lepore, the town engineer, uh, about some of my con continuing concerns about this. He's in the back there. I don't know whether to bring him up. I don't know whether he's prepared to discuss this. Uh, but uh, Mr. Lepore, if you wanted to, to say anything, you're more than welcome. If not, we'll certainly understand you will be here again uh, when you're better prepared. So uh, we look forward to, to hearing from you on that. Uh, Mr. Nicoletti, thank you very much for coming and, and, and raising uh, some of these issues, the uh, another $2,000, $200,000 budget cut is just devastating for a library that has had budget cuts, I think, for the last six or seven years. Just so that everybody knows, the state law requires minimum funding of, of township libraries, uh, a minimum amount of funding based upon the total value of property in the township. And during the time period, I guess the last six years, the value of our property has declined rather precipitously, and that has led to uh, reductions in the minimum amount of funding that the town has to make for the library. Now, the law doesn't say the town can't provide additional funding on top of that minimum, but the council majority in the last couple of years, I've been raising this issue, and, and so have the folks from, from the school, um, from the library, have been raising uh, issues about how devastating the, the cuts are. And to hear that even in a year when apparently our property value has stopped, our total property value has stopped shrinking, uh, I just can't believe that, that we're suffering, that we're talking about another $200,000 uh, budget cut. Um, so I'm very concerned about that and some of the forward-looking uh, expenditures that Mr. Le Nicoletti raised is very helpful uh, to get a better idea of of what the library is facing. And I, I too have noticed that the facade uh, at, the, at the library has been, uh, it hasn't been existing for a long time. Just to, to jog everyone's memory, uh, a piece of the facade fell down and uh, as, as part of the follow up to that, the cleanup, the entire facade was taken off, but it's been uh, months and months. And I, I can't recall if the council has discussed that before about why we haven't uh, put the facade back on since we took it off. It seems to me if we took it off, we probably need to <laughs> bear responsibility for putting it back on. But I, I got from Mr. Nicoletti's uh, comments that maybe there's some dispute or some discussion between the library and, and the township uh, about who's going to pay for the facade. So uh, we would certainly like to, to hear more about that. And I, I, You'll have to forgive my memory if we've actually discussed this before. We have, yes. We have, we have Councilman. And, and what is this situation? Yeah, we, uh, the situation still hasn't been resolved. The administration has been talking with the public library representatives about uh, the best way of funding that, um, that rehab, I guess, at this point. Um, it is a public building. 
uh, meaning that it's owned by the town. Um, however, you know, there's a there's still negotiating going on as far as like how it should be paid, whether it be you know the municipality, whether it be the library, or whether it be half and half. So, but we've had this discussion, okay, uh, and it's still going on. And as you know, it's budget season, so these are some of the issues that we need to um, really tackle and concern ourselves with, and see where uh, you know where the investments are going to be put on for the next fiscal year. Okay, thank you, thank Council you President. You'll have to forgive me, I'm, I'm somewhat hoarse, so uh, I'll try to speak more clearly. Uh, Mr. Marowitz and uh, Ms. Morelli, thank you for coming up and, and requesting a uh, presentation in English. I, I hope that we will be getting that from uh, Ms. Credidio and perhaps some of the other uh, redevelopment uh, related folks who I see are here tonight. And I totally agree with your request to have a Q&A following the presentation uh, because I, I think it's important if you don't understand something in the presentation that you'd be able to ask while the experts are here and we can and tie off uh, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues. Um, Mr. Malanga has uh, uh, been very active in, in the development of the redevelopment project going back a long ways. He asked two questions that hopefully we, we can answer. Um, I may not know what the current thinking is about this, but when he asked about the affordable housing in the 71 units, he was correct that the township is uh, obligated to provide those. Under the current, afford uh, uh, current uh, governing documents for redevelopment, that obligation, which would normally be put on the redeveloper in this first phase, what we're calling phase one, the property of the Edison uh, battery factory, have been pushed back to the second and third phases that are planned, but at this point are not obligated to take place. So I think Mr. Malanga is uh, certainly justifiable in his concern because if phases two and three do not take place, the town will be obligated to pay this, uh, pay this obligation unless the state law, which is changed continuously since I've been on the council, uh, changes yet again to, to, uh, to modify that obligation. And I don't know whether I should ask Mr. Sayers if, if there's a clear answer to where things stand now and, and where they might stand if we don't do the second or third. But this has actually been, been raised before and, and uh, has been passed by the majority as of, council. As of this point, they're obligated to do certain co-housing. As you said, the, the law is in flux. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it, hasn't, uh, it still hasn't been uh, ruled finalized. upon and finalized on how they're going to allocate it. Um, so that number could change. The only misconception is that uh, those units do not necessarily have to be paid off by the township. They can be sold off to another community. They can be, there can be other developers who come in who want to buy that, that, that co-obligation. So there are other options if, in fact, that does happen. But we don't anticipate that happening. Okay. I'm trying to think if there's another issue that I've missed here. Um, anyway, I'll stop talking. I'm losing my voice anyway. Thank you, everyone who, who came and spoke tonight. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, and I just want to make sure the public notes that, uh, as the count, Councilman Kovic and the other council members mentioned, uh, our engineer, Len Lepore, is here listening to the issues and the concerns regarding Gregory. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're paying attention to uh, some of those concerns and some of those uh, ticket items. Uh, the issue with the water flow uh, is uh, something new to me. Uh, so I want to make sure that we, we look into that and uh, we have some sort of feedback uh, as we move the process along. Uh, other than that, we're going to move on to the next uh, agenda item. What does that sound? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounded like I was in church. I thought I was in church for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Clark, did you, did you have... Uh, I didn't do anything. No, he, I went. No, Jerry spoke oh, twice. <laughs> <laughs> He's cut off. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but we will address all the redevelopment issues as, uh, in, in, in a couple of minutes. 
Uh, and uh, we will ask uh, Ms. Cordidia to come up here and uh, summarize the uh, resolutions for us in the language that we can all understand. Uh, Madam Clerk. Um, okay, consent agenda, approval of minutes of previous meeting, public meeting, February 9th, 2016. Consent. Report of township officers, none. Reading of petitions and communications and bids, none. Bill, bills, are there any questions on the bills? Consent. 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 Resolutions, are any resolutions being pulled this evening? Madam Clerk, we will be uh, pulling resolutions 7116 and 7216. Okay. Any others? Any of my colleagues wish to pull any resolutions? No. no. Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Is there I do have a question, oh. though. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mayor. Um, Jack, on resolution 6116, I know this is um, a temporary resolution about making the U-turns at Eagle Ridge. This, I mean, it can, it's, it's continual. I mean, I yes. know this has been um, addressed. I know there is a huge trailer up there now with the sign. There are and you watch one car after another still making the U-turn in front of Eagle Ridge. We had a discussion with the contractors because what was happening was uh, based upon the fact that they're, they're fixing the highway, they shut that exit ramp down, yeah. or I should say that entrance ramp entrance. down. And we've had, uh, we've had police officers up there almost every day. Um, for now, they've agreed to put that flashing light up, sign up there that says no U-turn, but we cannot enforce that unless we pass this ordinance and it'll only be a temporary ordinance until the construction is completed and then you know we're gonna we'll get rid of it but uh, it was suggested that we pass the temporary ordinance this way when we have police officers okay. out There's there people are doing good turns we can enforce it good okay thank you i have a okay i have a question council president Yes, Councilman. Okay, um, administration, I have a question on resolution 62-16. Uh, work with the um, professional services for Gordon regarding retention of special counsel for tax appeals involving environmental issues. Is there, or, uh, or Mr. Kayser, if you can answer, do we have a good number of tax appeals that are related to environmental issues? I really don't know what the percentage is. I doubt it's very high. Um, I know Mike Gordon very well. Uh, that firm is recognized as one of the best, if not the best, environmental firm in the state of New Jersey. Mike Gordon wrote a lot of the environmental laws that we have. Right. Uh, he was a deputy attorney general many years ago. Um, but I can't tell you how many you know, appeals we have that involve environmental issues. It's obviously somewhat of a specialized area. Given the amount of money that we spent last year from before, it's very, very small. We spent less than a couple thousand dollars. So. Okay. How many number, do you have off the top of your head number of um, appeals that were involved? Uh, in? You know, it's, it's got to be it's got to be one or two. It's got to be a lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. If I could just follow up on that, sure. weren't these weren't wasn't this firm hired specifically to address the property tax appeals from Prism on the property in the redevelopment area? I think that is one of the properties. That there are, but there that there are other, at least one other I, I, appeal. I, 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 I okay. can't give you a, a, a solid answer. What are, what are the cases okay. of tonight? I, I know there's a couple of cases. I don't know. I've seen the block and blocks. I don't know which the addresses we were. From, so. Thank you. I have a quick question on number sixty-nine, sixteen. Sure. Just. Um, this, the release of the sortie bond for uh, Old Indian Road, now those, is that where those homes are built, those newer homes on that short street, or is that uh, different homes that will be built? That's, that's it. It's just to yeah, finish up it. the driveway. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the curbing. Okay. 69-16. Release of surety bond. And Mr. Lepore is here Old to Indian answer that. Road. Evening, Mr. Lepore. It's not the short street on Lewis Court. It's right around the corner on Old Indian Road, just west of North Edgewood Avenue. Okay. And uh, we're still holding the bond. It's just not, it's going to be all cash, not a paper bond. Okay. So we're in a, a better position. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Any, anyone else? Questions? Seeing none? Uh, Madam Clerk? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The consent agenda is implemented. Okay. 
Resolution 7116, one, Madam Clerk. Yes, resolution of the Township of West Orange authorizing the termination and discharge of certain recorded documents relating to Block 66, Lots 1, 5, and 7 within the redevelop I'm sorry, downtown redevelopment area, <coughs> commonly known as the Edison bat Battery Site. Council President. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Ms. Cordidio. Good evening, Council President Cirillo, members of the governing body. For the record, my name is Jennifer Credidio. I'm a partner with the firm of McManam in Scotland and Bauman, located in Roseland, and we uh, have the privilege of serving as the municipality's redevelopment council. Um, Council President, would you like me to do both resolutions at once or uh, no, we one should at a time? do them independently. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, Resolution 7116 authorizes the execution of two documents. The first is a termination of a reverter clause that exists in a 2009 deed from the township. And the second is a discharge of a declaration of covenants and restrictions that was executed around the same time. So, how these documents came into being. In 2006, as we all know, we executed a redevelopment agreement with Prism Green Associates. And that is not only for Edison Battery, but um, as was discussed previously, for phases two, three, and four of the redevelopment that would occur around Edison Battery. Um, concurrently with the execution of that agreement, uh, Prism Green purchased the Edison Battery site from the prior owner. Um, some point between 2006 and 2009, there was a desire to transfer the Edison battery site from Prism Green into GP 177 Urban Renewal, which was a um, entity solely created for the purpose of developing and operating the Edison battery site proper redevelopment. So as you know, we have urban renewal entities that enter into uh, agreements with respect to specific redevelopment projects. So that's the only business that entity undertakes. It only uh, applies to that property. So the redeveloper requested of the township in 2009 that we assist them in the transfer of that property from Prism Green to GP 177 by going through the condemnation process, it's sometimes referred to as a friendly condemnation. That process was effectuated in 2009, and the property was transferred from the township to GP 177 by the deed that we're discussing tonight. Now, the 2006 agreement required that any time the township was going to undertake condemnation and was going to transfer property, we were required to put into the deed a reverter clause that basically said if the redeveloper did not do what it was supposed to do under the, under the agreement, the property would come back to the township. So that is how um, the clause that we're all talking about came into being. And that's sort of what we've tried to lay out, apparently inartfully, <laughs> in, the, uh, in Resolution 7116 that you have here tonight. Now, when we met in August, the governing body considered several agreements and resolutions in connection with the decision to move forward with DGP Urban Renewal, a joint venture of Dune Real Estate, Greenfield, and PRISM to redevelop the site. Um, those resolutions, which I believe are 201, 202, and 203 uh, that were adopted in August, authorized an amendment to the 2006 agreement that it would no longer apply to the Edison Battery site because we would enter into a completely new agreement that only governed Edison Battery and was between DGP, Urban Renewal, and the township. Now the reverter clause and the declaration of covenants and restrictions that are referenced in this resolution refer specifically to obligations under the 2006 agreement which if, if and when these agreements are executed will no longer apply to the site. So it creates an impression of obligations continuing under agreements that 
are no longer intended to govern the property. So the lender for the project has requested that the township authorize a termination of reverter that will be recorded in the land records that will show that that agreement is no longer um, on this property and that there is no reverter clause therefore related to that agreement. With respect to the declaration of covenants and restrictions, there are a list of covenants and restrictions that are in the redevelopment agreement in 2006. For example, the redeveloper agrees not to discriminate in renting out the units in the project. The redeveloper agrees not to transfer the property uh, in violation of the project. And those are all recorded against the property so that the world is on notice and any potential future purchaser of the property is on notice that that property is subject to those rules and restrictions. Again, that 2009 declaration all refers to the 2006 agreement, which it's the intention will no longer apply. However, concurrently at the same time, I should stop saying concurrently, the same time as the discharge of the earlier declaration, there will be the recording of a new declaration of covenants and restrictions that refers to the new agreement with DGP. Sorry, that was kind of long-winded. And the new agreement was 2458.15, which they approved in August. That's the financial the agreement. Financial agreement. The fin the, I'm referring to the redevelopment okay. agreement. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask my colleagues uh, if uh, you have any questions for Ms. Credidio on the resolution, on this resolution, on her explanation and summary. We can get on to any other subject matter later, but for now on the language that she just summarized, we we'll want to make sure we all understand what she just spoke about uh, and that uh, you know the legal language makes sense to us as uh, non-attorneys, right? None of us are attorneys. I, I, I have a question. Uh, my question is, um, you mentioned that the, the new RDA makes invalid the 2006 RDA, I mean the redevelopment agreement. It validates, the new RDA invalidates the 2006 RDA for phase one. Correct. Okay, so the reverter is no longer valid because it goes away with the 2006 agreement. Correct. Because for it, phase it, one. Correct. So my question to you is, does, is it, does it still remain in, in whatever life that 2000 RD, 2006 RDA still has? So the 2006 Not really, because it had to do with phase one uh, condemnation authority back in the day. I answered my own question. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to clarify, the only reverter that exists currently is with respect to this particular property. It doesn't affect any other property in the redevelopment area. There is no right of reverter on the other properties, so there's, it only affects Edison Battery. My second question, one last question, uh, colleagues, before I yield. Um, you mentioned about the new declaration of covenant or the, the new restrictions. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you talk about what those restrictions are? Sure. Uh, give me one second. And again, the requirement to draft and record the declaration is set forth in the redevelopment agreement that you authorized in August. Okay. But uh, I'll just briefly summarize. Um, the redeveloper covenants and agrees that it will not discriminate, uh, that it will comply with governing law, including the redevelopment agreement and the redevelopment plan that it will make diligent efforts to obtain all governmental approvals, um, that it will not suspend or discontinue the performance of its obligations, that it will diligently undertake construction and development of the phase one project, that it will not um, use um, mortgage or otherwise transfer the project as collateral for an unrelated transaction, that they'll take steps to mitigate construction impacts, including you know, dust and debris, that they will cause the project to be developed 
um, financed and constructed in accordance with the redevelopment agreement that they will notify the township of any material adverse change in their financial condition and that they'll keep and maintain um, the improvements in good condition. Now the end of the declaration sets forth the timing. All of those um, obligations are in effect for so long as the redevelopment agreement is in effect um, with the exception of uh, they are on a continuing basis required to comply with all applicable law to not discriminate and to maintain the improvements in good condition. Thank you very much for the summary, Ms. Cordidia. Colleagues, any questions on the resolution well, and the language? Just on that. And part of this is saying that we are terminating that the original agreement and picking up the same, those new restrictions with this new DGP. They're very similar. Um, there were two changes, um, two substantive changes. One uh, made reference to a condominium association, which this is going to be a rental project. Uh, and the other one referred to the duration of the redevelopment plan because the, your redevelopment plan actually has an expiration date in it uh, and I believe it expires in 17 years. So it was very similar but you know there were two changes. Again though it is consistent with the, with the covenants and restrictions that are set forth in the redevelopment agreement that was authorized in August. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else on, on the language? Okay. So when I saw that scary word reverter, <laughs> uh, I wanted to find out more about it. If I can convey to you my understanding and you can tell me how I'm wrong, it might help because uh, I'll try to put it in simple yeah. language. When I looked at reverter, I said, oh, that means that the property would revert back to its previous owner if something happens. In this case, what something would happen would be an event of default. It would be an event of default for which we terminated the agreement. So not just any default, but a default that the township decided to terminate the agreement that it was sufficiently serious and that the property would come back to the township, correct? Right, and under the current plans, notice of an event default is, uh, an event of default is followed by a cure period. Correct. And who knows what else might happen in that interim. The bank wanted to get rid of this because, mm -hmm. as you said in the document, it placed a potential cloud over the title. And they wanted to be clear that that was not something that was going to happen automatically. It's not just that it's not something that will happen automatically. You know, we're terminating the reverter clause. But the lender's more significant concern, as it was expressed to us, is that the trigger, the point at which that reverter can be exercised, relates to an agreement that they're not a part of, that's not subject to the property that they're financing. So that was their, their bigger concern is, we're not part of the 2006 agreement, we don't have obligations under the 2006 agreement, and it looks like a failure under that agreement would somehow affect this property, which wasn't, I think, the intention of all of the steps we've taken to this point. Okay, so the practical effect of getting rid of the reverter and moving on to the new uh, governing documents in this area is that there isn't a reverter there. That's you correct. won't see the reverter there, but under the scenario of a, an event of default that is not cured, that is not fixed by either the redeveloper or the lender, the property would come back to the town even without the reverter? That's not correct. Okay, so what would happen so to what, the property? So what can happen in that instance is you can terminate the redevelopment agreement, which terminates the rights to undertake the project. Section 10.7 of the agreement talks about the designation of a replacement developer. So. Um, as a practical matter, if you're in a default scenario, most likely what's going to happen is the developer is going to bring to you someone that they're proposing to replace them, and you're not going to go through this process. But assuming that didn't happen, we have a default, it wasn't cured by the developer, it wasn't cured by the lender, they didn't bring us someone new, 
and propose that they're designated. We can terminate the agreement and we have a right to designate a replacement redeveloper. When that replacement redeveloper purchases the property from the existing redeveloper, Section 10.7 lays out um, how the proceeds of that purchase are allocated. First, to any money that's owed to the township for uh, taxes, you know, outstanding payments, outstanding escrow fees, or anything to that effect, legal fees. Um, second, to reimburse the redeveloper for the money that they've put in the ground. However, in connection with that, uh, that section also provides they will provide to the replacement redeveloper plans, specifications, construction drawings, so that the project can be completed. After that, any money remaining after those two items, uh, the remainder goes to the township. So is the township's position changed between the old reverter language and the new governing documents? It is. Okay. And is that a negative impact to the township potentially? It doesn't sound like it's potentially a positive, so. Well, and if the, it's not neutral, then it's negative. The problem is, is that reverters are very, it is extremely, if not impossible, diffi very difficult to finance a project that has a reverter on it. Um, because, you know, a lender is coming in and putting significant money into the property, and their collateral is the property. So, you know, it's extremely difficult to get the project done. Um, the other problem is that the language that's there relates to obligations that are no longer going to apply to the property. So, yes, you're removing a right that the township has, but it's a right that relates to an agreement that this body had already decided is no longer going to apply to the property going forward. So I would view it more as a cleanup or consistency item because you know that, that process has already been gone through. Um, to the extent that you can't undertake the project with the reverter on the property, it may be a right of the township, but if it actually prevents the objective of the redevelopment agreement to get the uh, project developed, to revitalize downtown, to start generating the pilots, uh, and bring you know a new 24-7 uh, community to Main Street, I think that the removal of the reverter achieves those objectives that the township has decided it wants to pursue. So the, so the council majority's vote on this last August is what actually made the reverter essentially moot because if we're doing away with the 2006 redevelopment agreement as it pertains to phase one, that's when we got rid of it. it, it it's not that it's moot, you still need to take action to authorize it, but yes, the, the uh, decision to go from the 2006 agreement to the new agreement created this inconsistency that needs to be resolved, that's okay. accurate. So the two balances here are that the town's right to get that property back in the mm -hmm. event of a default mm -hmm. under the old reverter mm -hmm. is one way of looking at it is that it's offset by the fact that the project can go forward because the lender would not. That's absolutely right. Okay. And we gave this, and we essentially gave this up last August in the vote. I mean, it, it's it's inconsistent. It, it it's not consistent with the with the path that we've uh, decided to follow. And so, if the council votes to not approve this tonight, it's highly unlikely that the project would move forward because the the lender would not. That's absolutely right. Okay, thank you. I know I know you were very generous with your time <laughs> explaining this, uh, but I just I thought maybe it might be helpful for people. Absolutely. And clearly, I needed more education, so I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman? Well, uh, also, lang on the language? Yeah, language. also the point with the reverter that the reverter, even if this stayed in effect, would, would go away if a certificate of occupancy is issued once the project That's is, a great is point, cleaned. Councilwoman. The, the reverter only stays, it, it was a 
right to make sure the project is built. So once the project is completed, that reverter terminates of its own accord in any event. Yeah, um, it's a great point. I, I guess to simplify this for, for folks out there is, it's, it's a, not a great comparison, but if you were, uh, you, you have your first mortgage and you have a line of credit on your property and you're going to refinance. Um, you have that um, equity line hanging out there and you, um, you're paying off that first mortgage, but that equity line's already recorded. Well, these documents are already recorded. So you're not going to find a lender to come in and give you that new mortgage unless you either subordinate that other equity line or even if it's not active, close it out and, and make it go away. And that's kind of what's happening here. The lender's not going to come in and uh, without these title issues getting cleaned up. So um, looking at the um, Declaration of Covenants, that's, that was an easy one because uh, once we received the document, thank you for sending that to us so we could compare and see what the differences were. So one is just substituting the other. And uh, this discharge of uh, this deed here is, um, you know, d you know ma makes sense with, um, with the consistency so it's it's just cleaning up uh, mr sayers just walked away but when i had a conversation with him uh, yesterday i was excited to hear that um you know the title company are call you know making sure that the you know checking on uh, the taxes and so i know you're getting close to closing which is very exciting and um so cleaning up these issues um is appropriate and um I appreciate, uh, Ms. Credidi, all your time that you have spent Absolutely. wrapping our heads around it. Um, I know the language is, is intimidating sometimes to read, but it's not uh, meant for us, it's for the attorneys. <laughs> and uh, and uh, if something goes to court, they, they will be better to understand it. So um, thank you for taking your time. And I hope there's clarity out there in the public. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilwoman, that was all addressed. Okay. So. I just have some quick questions, uh, uh, Ms. Cordidio. Uh, oh, Ms. Um, Ms. Morelli, uh, how is construction completion defined? Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to address uh, that with the second. with the second. Okay. Resolution. All right. We'll address that. Um, mm -hmm. That's right. Yes, because that came from that little paragraph. Mm -hmm. Uh, correct. So we'll we'll get to that resolution. Well, I have one more point, Councilman, that I, I think will help clarify for the public also. Um, so you're gonna, because I had asked you what exactly will be recorded. So these, uh, the declaration, the agreements, mm -hmm. and then um, come the summertime, the special assessment tax will be will be placed and the, Correct. that lien will be recorded at that time. Correct, the special protects, assessment agreement. And that and that protects our interests at that point in time. Uh, with respect to uh, a portion of the debt service on the bonds to be issued, that's correct. Thank you, colleagues. Any other questions? Yes. I was just going to, if, if the, uh, my council colleagues were finished asking the questions, I, I know Ms. Morelli had asked if, for a Q&A period following that i just wondered if uh, by the council president's leave and by my colleagues leave if you want to ask if there are any questions uh from the audience uh, it's not that was clear. process there's no question you're absolutely right about it i just wondered if uh, perhaps we could make an exception here just ask for a show of hands very quickly with questions yeah it's not standard process but thank you for asking unless my colleagues would like to override that decision uh, we don't take questions from the audience when we're discussing a resolution This is not an ordinance. This is a resolution. Is right. There's no question it is. The, the question is, does the, does the rest of the council, I, I want to give uh, the uh, audience members a chance to do a Q&A. If the rest of the colleagues don't want to do it, then we'll move on. But we have the request from the residents. So. What is the uh, legalities, uh, Mr. Kayser, in regards to taking a poll from our, whether we want to uh, bypass council? You, you can do that if you want. Nothing yeah. stop you from doing that. Yeah. So right. are, they quick, are, are they quick questions? Just yeah. quick. You can, I mean, if you, you can limit the time. You don't have to, it's not <laughs> open-ended. You can give them Two five minutes, minutes, 10 minutes, minutes whatever it is. Okay, again, if my colleagues would like that, I mean. 
to uh, well, play, just, play a show of hands? Would you like to take questions from the audience? I mean, again, we'll, we can go off procedure here. I think there were, Council President, there were questions that were raised. They pertain to 7216 more so than this 7116. This really is clearing up the titles. I don't know that there are any questions, but I mean, there were questions that were raised that I believe we will address. Uh, they pertain more to the second resolution, not to this one. Uh, but so would you like to take colleagues? For what's your decision? Why don't we do this? Why don't we, if we're going to move on to 7216 and that's see what's addressed and see if they're still... I'm, I'm, I just want to note that I'm very, like, I like order, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And I like consistency. Sure. Okay, if in a world full of chaos, in a world <laughs> correct, full council of president. not order, inconsistency, then we don't have process and, and we compromise the process. Uh, but, you know, the rules are not written in stone. We can always make exceptions. And if, again, if you want to go off and take questions from the audience, I mean, I'm, I'll be more than happy to do that. So, who? Well, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of it. I'm in favor of consistency. I'm, so. I'm, in fine. I'm fine with the quick questions, not long That's statements, but. Okay, so five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, councilman. That's that's fine. Everybody okay. talk fast. So let's. Uh, we're not again. We're sh let's stick to this resolution, please. Yeah. Okay, let's right. stick to the okay. language. Help okay. us make a policy decision here, uh, and I uh, would appreciate their input. So uh, yeah, just come up to the podium, please. Thank you, Council President. Mike Thank Alex. you, Council. This is, this is probably a very easy question to answer, but I'm a bit confused. Does, will the township of West Orange still have the ultimate first lien on a, in a foreclosure situation, or will the lender have it with this reverter? Because if this, if this reverter was blocking money coming into the project by the bank, maybe they're not happy with, their, with the lineup. Maybe they want to be ahead of West Orange, which I think would be terribly inappropriate because the, uh, you know, the citizens of West Orange are involved in this project. So, uh, if you could just explain that to me. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Marowitz. And uh, yeah, name and address, right? Nineteen Howell. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah um, yes, Ms. Crediti. Um, I thought you might. Do you want me to do them one at a time or just one more? Probably. Yeah. I would think. I, I don't just know. Do one, one at a time. Yeah. One at a time. <laughs> Okay, so first lien position, and in case of a foreclosure, what's the, uh, or what's the process? Sure, so um, a reverter and a foreclosure situation, not exactly the same thing in, in either event. For example, you know, a reverter, this reverter clause is triggered by a default under the 2006 agreement. If there was a uh, non-payment of mortgage today and there was a foreclosure, that reverter doesn't give us a first lien on the property. We have we'll, we will have first lien status with respect to p payment of pilots, with respect to payments of special assessments, the same way we have with respect to municipal taxes um, throughout the town, but that's not related to the reverter clause. So to answer uh, Mr. Meyerowitz's uh, question more directly, no, the municipality will not have a first lien in a foreclosure situation. But there wouldn't be a lender pressed anywhere to, if we didn't Any other charges. speakers are uh, wishing That's to correct. ask a question? That's correct. Michelle is finishing that, sorry. What's that? She was asking her another question. Oh, I'm sorry, I, again, I need order here. Uh -huh. I need order. I apologize. It was just a statement. I was just stating that there would be a lender hard pressed to to, to make a loan if, we, if they didn't clear title and, and clear that discharge. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Malanga? Kevin Malanga, Rich Road. Uh, Council President Cirilla, I'm grateful yes, that you are modifying the rules of procedure and making this opportunity available to us. Thank you. Ms. Gordillo, with respect to the reverter, the reverter was present in the 2006 agreement. Is, is that right? Please ask your question. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. the, so, ask it and then she'll answer. 
And then the reverter was present in subsequent modifications to the redevelopment agreement up until this very last iteration of the agreement that's now with Dune, which leads me to question why it was good for the last nine and a half years, and suddenly it's not good. And suddenly it becomes an impediment to the financing of this project. Thank you, Mr. Malanga. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's because yeah, of because the, of the type of financing yeah. that we're seeing. It's a new world it's a construction since 2006. But, Ms. Cordidia. Well, so there's, uh, that is certainly the case that, you know, um, since 2009, uh, lending criteria have evolved um, greatly. Uh, you know, each lender is also different in what they request. It's important to note that the right of reverter in the deed in 2009 was subject to a mortgage that was on the property. So the lender uh, still had their, their mortgage rights. Again, it was a limited right of reverter. Um, so that is uh, why it was on the properly, property previously and would not be on the property going forward. Okay, Council President. Ms. Morelli, I saw you raise your hand. Okay. Rosary Morelli, Ralph Road, still doesn't help. Somehow I feel, this is a comment, that the reverter gives or favors the new developer more than it does West Orange. Now I could be wrong, as I said, didn't take the bar. Um, Mr. Kayser was correct as far as parliamentary procedure. You have a ordinance of the council. You can do whatever you like. You're the president. And I'll offer you, we're having a parliamentary procedure seminar either in May or June, the West Orange African Heritage Organization. I'm going to invite you. Thank you. Um, the other is, uh, what constitutes default? Originally it was non-payment of taxes What's included now, is that still one of the conditions of default? She'll answer you at the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rosary. <clears throat> the remote remo removal, whether it um, benefits the town or the um, developer and what constitutes default at this point? Um, the default provisions, um, and I don't have the 2006 agreement and the, the 16 agreement to lay side by side, but you know, they are, I would say, substantially consistent. They were certainly modeled after the 2006 um, agreement. And yes, non-payment of taxes is a default, suspension of construction of the project. Basically, a default is any obligation that the developer has under the, um, under the agreement that is not performed and then not cured after notice to cure, um, unless it's excused by a force majeure event. I know that's a legal term, but basically an emergency. Force majeure events are often you know, acts of God, extreme weather, et cetera. So default is anything they're supposed to do that they're not doing, that they haven't cured after we give them notice, and that is not excused by some emergency as set forth in the agreement. Thank you, Ms. Cordidio. Yeah, any uh, fa fails to uh, observe or perform any covenant, condition, representation, warranty, or agreement, and any other failure, act, or omission by the redeveloper is designated um, as, a, as a default item. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Clemens. Mario Clemenson for Cherrywood Circle. Um, thanks again for allowing us to ask questions really quickly. Um, let's see, I'm, try I'm uh, trying to understand this. So with the absence of the reverter clause, does that mean that um, if there's an event of default, uh, then the bank, the lender, does it, uh, I guess this implies that the lender wants to take the position of 
finding a substitute redeveloper, let's say? I mean, I, I'm just trying to understand what the new lending terms are all about. I mean, I understand, by the way, that this is a very serious market environment we're in all of a sudden. So I'm not surprised to have all kinds of weird little things come up that we didn't know about because it's very difficult to get financing in general in many markets. Yeah. So, um, so I'm just trying to figure out um, what powers do, does the lender have to then work with. It just sounds like they're in, in interjecting themselves, which, which is natural if they're going to be running the project um, or owning it. Um, will they take the position of finding a new developer if the uh, the period of, of, of default is, has not been cured? And you know, I'm, I'm just trying a little more clarity along that line. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so the lender's rule in in the situation of default. So the lender has rights um, under the agreement, completely unrelated to the reverter. The lender has rights to cure any default. Um, and that is a significant protection for the township and commonly seen in these types of agreements because, um, you know, for example, if there is a payment that needs to be made that hasn't been made, the lender wants to be able to preserve their position to make sure that their, the agreement continues, the ability to construct the project continues. So they want the ability to make that right, to make the payment uh, in that example. Uh, and that's unrelated to the reverter. And we're actually going to get to that in a few minutes when we talk about 7216, because one of the changes that is set forth in that resolution specifically talks about the lender's right to cure. Really, more than anything, I think their motivation here is that they, um, you know, the reverter trigger is related to an agreement that's no longer going to be in effect, that doesn't apply to the property, that is, you know, that the owner of the property is not a party to, the lender certainly not a party to, that they have no rights to cure under that agreement. Um, and uh, it's just really to, to remove inconsistency between the documents. We'll, uh, we'll get more into it, um, Ms. Clemenson, uh, on the second resolution as well. Anyone else with questions? Seeing none, colleagues? Um, I, I, I appreciate that you yes. took the time to answer their questions. Thank I think you. it's important in this part for everyone to get full clarity of, uh, of the situation. I guess I just want to help folks along a little bit. Um, and, and to Mr. Malanga's point, you shouldn't really read anything else into this other than the explanation the attorney gave and reason being after um, as I refer to as the economic tsunami of 07 when uh, all the banks uh, fell and every everything came back um, year after year there's been more and more regulation in regards to financing and uh, for folks if you've refinanced your own home you've seen the closing uh, statements change through the course of the year and it just changed again this past October so um, there's a lot of regulations. It's not unusual for lenders to to ask, uh, you know, to cross their T's and dot their I's. And uh, I just hope the explanation was beneficial to everyone out there. But thank you, Council President, thank for you. taking the time. Thank you for your experience. <coughs> Seeing on Madam Clerk. Is there a motion to adopt Resolution 71-16? So moved. Second. Councilwoman Casalino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? No. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Cirillo? Yes. Madam Clerk, uh, 72-16. Resolution of the Township authorizing revisions to an agreement with DGP Urban Renewal LLC for the rede redevelopment of certain property in the downtown redevelopment area, commonly known as the Edison Battery Factory. Council President? Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Ms. Codidio, please uh, pay special attention to that language that Ms. Uh, um, Clemenson. No, it wasn't Ms. Clemenson. Clemenson yeah. That was the second issue. Now, before that, it was um, we had Rosary with the uh, questions on the uh, wording of that specific paragraph uh, 4.1a. Sure. 
So in August, um, you authorized a new redevelopment agreement with DGP Urban Renewal. And as part of the lender's due diligence process, their counsel, Ballard Spar, um, provided a number of comments and requests with respect to the documents, um, you know, including cleanup requests, um, you know, for clarity, um, you know, this letter should be a capital instead of a lower case, et cetera. And also um, these specific requests, which really constitute um, substantive changes to the document. So the particular language that uh, you're being requested to consider is set forth at Exhibit A to the resolution. Uh, the first change is in 4 .1, Section 4.1 of the agreement. It also is a similar change at Exhibit D, and it's a change to the construction schedule. Um, the, while the redeveloper is still forecasting a 24-month construction schedule, the time frame for completion of the project that's set forth in their loan agreement with PNC Bank is 30 months with a potential for a six-month extension. Therefore, the lenders requested that the uh, time frame here in the redevelopment agreement be consistent with that time frame. So that's why we have uh, commencement occurring within 30 days of the date hereof would be uh, the date of execution of the agreement and then um, completion no later than February 1, 2019. Um, where we have the language, unless otherwise told or adjusted as provided in this agreement, a tolling is um, basically a suspension of the clock. Um, so uh, in my example before, if we had some sort of extraordinary weather, a Hurricane Sandy, God forbid, a blizzard, you know, something that really prevented, was an act of God that prevented the project from moving forward, that time for the agreement provides as, you know, the very standard provision that it's an act beyond anyone's control and therefore the time frame is told um, because of the impact of that, um, that event. Uh, with respect to, um, I know Ms. Morelli asked about the completion of the construction process. At the end of construction, the redeveloper uh, submits a request, written request to the township for a certificate of completion. It's very important to them to have the certificate of completion and to be able to record it against their property to uh, you know, signal that they've met all their obligations under the agreement. Once they give us that written request, the township has a month to review it and either say, yes, you have complied with everything under the agreement, or no, these are the things we don't think you've complied with. And then we go through a process. So the municipality has to sign off on uh, the fact that not only was the, con the project built, but that all of their obligations under the agreement have been met. Um, so that's section 4.1 and also exhibit D. Uh, section 10.2, which des uh, describes remedies in an event of default, um, this remedy in particular talks about the ability to terminate the agreement. And there was uh, a little lack of clarity because the redeveloper has a 30-day cure period, the lender has a 90-day cure period. Um, simply put, a bank is going to need a little more time to get familiar with what happened, what's the, the breach that needs to be fixed, how do we go about fixing it, maybe they need internal approvals from different committees, et cetera, to move forward with that plan. And they just wanted to clarify the language that the agreement's not going to be terminated while they're still working through the cure rights that they already have under the agreement. In section 10.7, we talk about the replacement of the redeveloper. And this would, relates back to that, um, those provisions that we were discussing before with respect to a new developer comes in and they purchase the property and how are the proceeds of that purchase allocated. Um, even though the bank has a, uh, um, will have a mortgage recorded against the property, there was a concern, they just wanted to clarify that that mortgage, the debt that has been issued, that's a cost that in order to fund the cost of the project are treated as part of the cost of the project for the purposes of that section. So it's three paragraphs worth of language. The only new language is in 
the section that starts with a two on the second page of Exhibit A, and it's underlined. So redeveloper's actual costs, including debt secured by a mortgage. The last change is in section 11.1, .1, which refers to insurance. Again, I uh, included about three paragraphs of verbiage there for ease of reference, but 11.1 .1 says the redeveloper will maintain insurance for its own interests and for whatever interests the township may have. Um, at current, not having any ownership interest in the property, um, the township doesn't actually have an insurable interest, but there's a potential for an insurable interest. So the lender wanted to clarify that with respect to casualty insurance, um, which is sort of amplified by this war risks um, insurance language that follows, but in event of a fire or a um, crazy event, I don't know what could actually take down the battery building. Um, I think it really would have to be a natural disaster. Um, but to the extent that there was a loss there, the lender wants the right to direct the insurance, the application of proceeds, which is typical yeah. in a, you know, any lending scenario, you're required to have homeowner's insurance, you know, I mean, yeah. it's a very uh, typical lender requirement, so they just wanted that, cl that clarity there. And then on the last page, we refer to Exhibit D as the construction schedule, and that's the same issue we already talked about at Section 4.1. Now, on the insurance certificates, are we uh, are we also named on whatever insurance is in place? You are as additional. Yeah. That's in language. Correct. Okay, colleagues. Uh, no, no. Let, let's go to the public. The, is the public ready with any questions? Well, I have something mm -hmm. that may help. Well, okay. Yeah. Yes. I, go ahead. The construction go schedule from the bank. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain to the public? on how that is going to keep this project on a timeline with the, a construction loan, how it works. So with a construction loan with a lender, you have a, a drawdown on um, completion of improvements. So clearly the lender is going to be very, very interested in monitoring the project and in the construction moving forward expeditiously so that those draws are released. And they, but they're inspected. The lender sent somebody out to Correct. inspect to make sure that the construction is completed before they release the fund. So they, there's a schedule that's set with the lender and the uh, and the borrower. Okay. Yes, no. Ms. Cordillo, there will be a, a constructive, basically construction schedule, right? That will be dealt with the bank. And when you talk about the drawdown schedule, so it'll be different phases how the money is drawn down based upon particular aspects of the project. Correct. Like when the garage is constructed, then the outer, and then the different sections. My question to you is, will the township and also the administration be given updates on the construction schedule? We certainly have the right to ask for progress reports. The redeveloper has, um, you know, uh, actually brought that up, um, that they would be more than happy to come in and give periodic progress reports. Um, you know, you're going to be able to see the progress as well, but you know, certainly we have the right to ask for progress reports, both written and progress report meetings. Right, because I would like to see something. Hopefully, we'll get something written. Because there are also, even though you may see what's going on, but you also need yeah. to see punch list items to make sure all the obligations, if each phase is being met. Well, and then you know, remember that at the end of the process, we do go through that certificate of completion <laughs> pro uh, process so that. You know, not only is the building up, but is it, you know, have all of the obligations under the governmental approvals and the and the redevelopment agreement been met? Okay. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. I have a question on that schedule as well. Uh, you mentioned that the redevelopers uh, target is 24 months, Correct. and that the bank is shooting for 30 months. My question is, um, if uh, the 24 month uh, construction schedule is met or is realized, would that result in a financial incentive, I guess, to the, um, to the developer? I mean, certainly, you know, if it's you been, finish early, it, it's been all carry to this point, right? You know, the, they've been carrying the property for a 
a significant period of time. Obviously, the earlier they can finish and start renting out units and start generating revenue, you know, obviously they have a significant financial incentive to do that. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing you said, Councilman, when you said that the bank is shooting for 30 months, I don't think that anyone's really anticipating 30 months. It's just that is they have a longer permitted time in their um, in their construction schedule with the lender, you know, to yeah. build in flexibility in case of things like extreme weather, et cetera. Sure. Okay. Anyone else questions? Public? Oh. Mr. Myrowitz. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Mark Meyer, it's 19 Howell Drive. Um, so is there actually a bank committed to funding this project? Because uh, last summer there was a lot of hoopla when Dune Partners came into the picture and every, there were big announcements. And uh, I haven't heard any announcement from anyone saying that a bank has made a commitment to this. So I'd like to know if a bank has actually made a commitment. So now we have uh, four people with financial commitments to this. We have a, so maybe a bank, maybe not. We have Prism who's putting in money. We have the former Dune. And why did they change their name to DGP Urban Renewal? Are they the same entity? Excuse me? Yes. Okay. And the taxpayers are financially committed. So, you know, is there a bank yet or is this just another hypothetical? And why was there no big announcement that a bank has made a commitment? Thank you, Mr. Marowitz. Uh, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, it's not that Dune changed their name. Uh, Dune was brought in as the new equity partner. DGP is a joint venture of Dune, Greenfield, and Prism, which is where we get the super snappy name, DGP, Urban <laughs> Renewal. That was one of the questions. Can you repeat that? Sure. Um, DGP is a joint venture of Dune, Prism, and Greenfield, which is why it's DG and P. Um, that, so Dune didn't change their name. Dune Real Estate Partners still you know, is its own separate entity. And that's consistent going back to your August approvals. Um, with respect to a bank, uh, it's PNC Bank, as I mentioned earlier, um, represented by Ballard's Bar. They have been working through, um, you know, documents very significantly with respect to the specifics of uh, the loan and, and commitments and such. Uh, you do have representatives from the redeveloper here if you'd like to ask them questions. But yes, it's PNC Bank is the bank in the deal. You know, previously when we were here in August, we needed to get to that point so that um, you know financing could be sought, bank financing could be sought and pinned down. And now, you know, as is very common as this part of the process, as the lender went through their due diligence items, these were the the four specific requests in addition to the other cleanup items that they had. Any other questions? Yes, Mario Clemens. Mm -hmm. Mira Clemenson, Port Cherrywood Circle. All right. <clears throat> so my question is, um, what happens if the project is delayed, not through force majeure, but is just delayed? And I think under the old agreement, older agreements, that would have been an event of default that then subject to cure. What if it goes beyond that period? Um, what happens then? It just seems like this new, these new, um, uh, this new language uh, gives the developer a little more leeway than what we gave him before. Just checking on that. It's a great question. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. The default and cure rights are very similar in the um, 2006 agreement as modified in 2014 and in the proposed uh, DGP uh, agreement. Obviously, if they um, if they fail to perform, that's you know still a default for which they have a uh, cure opportunity. If they don't cure, the municipality has a number of rights under the agreement 
uh, litigation um, is very common in that scenario, but right up to and including the right to terminate the agreement, which is a termination of their rights to develop the project. Thank you, Ms. Cordidio. Any other questions? Yes. Rosary Morelli, <clears throat> excuse me, Ralph Road. Bottom line, do they have $70 million? Are they getting the money? We're going through all this exercise. I get more confused by the hour. Are they getting $70 million? Because all of this was dependent on them getting the loan. Mr. Sayer said they had it. It was eminent. That's my question. Are they getting $70 million? Yeah. Thank you, and that's really the most important question, okay? <laughs> All this is that's meaningless really if that loan is not secured. Uh, can we address that? Just where we are in the uh, process. Yeah, the yeah, Council President, I, I think that's a question more appropriately addressed by the redeveloper, but you know, just for clarity, is connection with the approvals you're being asked to consider tonight the uh, termination of reverter and the discharge um, that you considered a few moments ago, the execution of a redevelopment agreement with these changes are all things that are going to be held in escrow and are not effectuated unless and until the loan closes. They would all happen concurrently with the acquisition of the property by DGP from GP 177 at the time of the loan closing. On that question, Ms. Cordidio, can you guide us along uh, the, the, the financing process on a construction loan from the LOI down to where we are now? Do you really want me to do that, <laughs> Council <laughs> President? In one minute. <laughs> um, I can't speak to this financing process In directly. Um, you know, the after the financial tsunami, the um, <laughs> the each lender takes a different approach. Um, sometimes you have letters of intent, letters of interest. Sometimes you have term sheets. Sometimes you have commitment letters for a good period of time. A lot of lenders were going directly to loan agreements and not having preliminary steps because they didn't want to be committed until they were absolutely committed and sure that they were going to finance and close the loan. Um, so um, Bringing in a commercial lender, obviously they're going to go through significant due diligence, especially on a project of this size and magnitude and of the significance of the uh, size of the loan. They're going to look through, make sure you have governmental approvals, make sure that the agreements are all agreements they can live with. They're going to go through the title process, as they obviously have been doing. Um, they're going to check all their boxes to make sure that there's no impediment to them being able to have a project that's going to be constructed that's going to secure their significant investment in the property. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes. Well, just to say, Jen, from what you just said, though, that's why we're here today. This is because of the lender going, doing the due diligence, just what you mentioned, checking all of those boxes, and this really was prompted by the lender to the new financial partner. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, can we answer the question? Are they getting the same thing? <laughs> can, any, any, no, can their financial no, 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 people? No, no, no. No? no. Okay. Any other questions? No. Nope. Seeing none, Madam Clerk. No. Is there a motion to adopt Resolution 72-16? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Councilwoman Casalino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? No. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Cirillo? Yes. Thank you, Madam Clerk, and thank you all for, uh, for your time and for being here. Jennifer, your one, wonderful work. You, you did a great thank job you. on you your spare much. time to guide us. <laughs> she was on vacation, by the way. The public should know that, and uh, how, how, she how, 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 had us on <laughs> conference calls, <laughs> and we made sure we were educated on this policy issue. Excellent. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we're going to recess for two minutes. Two minutes.
Madam Clerk, we're moving on to ordinances and second and final reading. Okay, ordinance 2476-16, an ordinance amending the revised general ordinances of the Township of West Orange, Chapter 23, Section 1.1, Establishing fees and rates at the Jenny Dunkel Pool for the 2016 season. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? So moved. Second. second. Okay. Councilwoman Castellino? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Cirillo? Yes. Any member of the public wishes to address our ordinance 2476-16 tonight? Yes, Claire. Good evening, Claire Silvestri, 20 Grandview Avenue. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask again, I know this is probably like three years running uh, and the pool fees about the idea of putting in um, the option of uh, day passes. I know that uh, while I have a, a, an annual membership, I do know that a number of my friends, neighbors I've heard would be interested in day passes. I think that there's, an, uh, there's enough capacity and opportunity at the pool for day passes. I think it would open up to a lot more residents to come and perhaps if they did the day passes they might see the benefit and in, in, in a subsequent year um, get a uh, uh, an annual membership but I really do think that the I go to the pool on a regular basis and I think there is there is capacity for the day passes and there seems to be a demand for it and I just request that the council consider that again thank you thank you Claire Seeing all the members of the public, any of my colleagues wish to speak uh, to this uh, ordinance? Yes, I'm, I'm also in favor of the day passes, and as you know, I've talked about uh, taking a look at membership, uh, what the trends are, and the revenue, and the, the membership of the pool, at the pool, continues to decline. And I got to, I don't know whether you guys uh, my colleagues have had a chance to take a look at the numbers. Uh, they, they weren't particularly good in 2013, which was the last time I recall that, that I and the council looked at it. But in 2014 and 2015, uh, the, big, the, the big hit has been on the memberships with, with the highest number of absolute membership. So in other words, individuals, uh, two people, three people, four people, five people. And then after that, uh, after five people, it really drops off in terms of the number of memberships. So if you look at the data, the memberships for the larger groups of people have continued to remain relatively strong, while in uh, 2014, uh, those top five categories I talked about, four of them uh, declined. And uh, these are all, so for example, uh, the individual went from uh, 66 memberships in 2013 to 56 in 2014. Uh, two member memberships went from 75 in 2013 to 68 in 2014. Uh, three members went from 184 to 162. Uh, four members went from 221 in 2013 to 211 in 2014. Uh, the senior membership stayed relatively stable. They either went up or went down by a little bit, and that's good news. They are the foundation of the, the pool uh, membership. Uh, things got better in 2015. Uh, compared to 2014. We had increases in individuals, in uh, three people, four people, and five people. All of those increased, so I would be greatly in, interested in knowing what the administration thoughts about what they did that might have uh, improved that membership from 2014 to 2015, uh, because we should probably do more of it. 
but if you compare 2015 to 2013, again, we're seeing major losses in the, in the, in the largest categories, which is the individual, uh, the, the uh, two-person, three-person, uh, and uh, individuals two, three, and uh, four and five actually increased in 2015 from 2013. So uh, 2015 was a much better year for us than 2014. What was really interesting to me, and I, and I hope we can hear from the administration on this, was the, uh, the guest revenue, uh, the number of guests and the guest revenue increased by a huge amount between 2014 and 2015. We didn't get that information previously back to 2013 and previous years. In, in both cases, both the total number of guest passes, which is just a day pass, but you can only get it through if you come in with a member, yes. rose 66%. We went from uh, just under 3,400 day passes uh, I'm sorry, guest passes in 2014 to well over 5,600 in 2015. I'd love to know how that happened. That's a 66% increase. And the revenue increased uh, as well by the same amount. It went from uh, a little over $21,000 in 2014 to a little over $35,000 last year. Again, a 66% increase. Those are really, uh, those are really good numbers. Um, and I'll just, I'll just say that uh, that also seems to support my suggestion that we, at the very least, have a trial program for day passes. Because you can see, when people can come on single days, for some reason, I don't know what happened in 2015, maybe we, maybe we got better weather, maybe there were more opportunities. Um, but those two issues uh, would, would love to hear from from the administration if they've had a chance to take a look at these because uh, things are not going well in the memberships, particularly in this, the, the categories with the largest absolute number. Uh, they approved a little bit in 2015, but, uh, and also the, the, um, the guest pass revenues. I'd love to hear either one of those, uh, what's going on, if the town did anything that they thought helped in those two areas. I guess Mr. Keogh would really need to give us the nuts and bolts of what I can what tell you what I believe it is, and I don't know this for a fact because I haven't really discussed the membership with Mr. Keogh, but the spray pad has definitely been a big, a big thing. At the yeah. Pool. That has increased people bringing children to the pool. And Extra kids. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It's been a really, to me, I think that's probably one of the major things that has pushed this up as much as it went up. But I don't know that for a fact. I mean, I'd have to talk to Billy about it, but my guess would be it would be the spray pad because 215 was the first full year that we had it in place. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what my, what my thought would be. But I don't know. He could be marketing it differently. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I haven't really had discussions with him about it. I, I know swim team has increased. Not that that would swim do team has definitely definitely increase you know we have the high school coach mark nevada working with them so i know their numbers have increased well. in the, oh uh -huh. they're doing phenomenal <laughs> uh -huh. they're they're really building a great program there and it's starting with the feeder program uh, with the wave swim club which um, i know that, pack, that generates a lot of parents and families so um but yeah i'd like to hear from mr keogh to see what we could do Let's to assist I created a file, though, of things to discuss at the budget hearing, and that is one of the ones to hear from the director and looking at the numbers that we have. And right, if the budget should sustain against, uh, single right. day memberships, mm -hmm. or single day passes, rather. Mm -hmm. Right, because okay. the argument on the other side is that it, it will affect the market, mm -hmm. and it'll throw the off the market, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll, we'll keep talking on that issue. And there are just so many new families in town that are not even aware of it. Yeah. So it really has a lot to do with the social media. It has a lot to do with even what the realtor program that was on Monday. Like that would even be good for new residents as well. Well, we PR committee, we pulled out the uh, one picture of the of a rec picture and we put the spray pad picture with the kids in it in the brochure. Oh, so. That's what's on their cover, <laughs> 2014. Yeah. That was their cover. 
Mm-hmm. And we, met, we mentioned the town pool and all the services at the realtor. And a lot of them didn't, never even heard of Ginny Duckle Pool, so. Well, I have new families every day, and same thing. We, we have okay. uh, actually Mr. Keogh coming to our next PR meeting to talk about it, and so we could assist him to get the word out of all his programs. So we'll, we'll ask him what we could do to help promote the town mm-hmm. pool. His newsletter is in your flyer. Mm-hmm. 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 And just to follow up on that, I think it might be helpful if Mr. Keogh came to a regular council meeting, yeah. which is videotaped, oh, yeah. and that people have an option, you know, to either watch or we can cut up the video and put it up on, on the, uh, on the town website. Just the part talking about the pool and if mm-hmm. there, if it reflects mm-hmm. other efforts in addition to the spray pad, we could use it to promote, uh, for promote it, as opposed to the budget hearings where mm-hmm. nobody comes and they're not videotape they're only oh i meant just to hear right two right. sides yeah, like idea. advocate for or against right 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 to have an internal policy exactly. discussion I believe there's already a video on our website about the pool oh cool there yeah. are but we have to direct people there no, so no, that's saying, what we're it's saying already out, it's already there mm-hmm. right. it's right. been there for a while yeah this would just be another re- this would be another potential yeah. way to reach people mm-hmm. by discussing you know the programs that the pool is doing well, does he come in periodically to promote his program? They so used to, right? We used to, yeah. 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 We used yeah, to bring the rec department. To, especially yeah. with the summer maybe programs we'll coming him. up. And then we'll, we'll, newsletter. we'll have the administration extend an invitation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good idea. Right. Good idea. Okay. Yeah. Anything else, colleagues? No. I, I was going to say, I'd, uh, I'm not going to vote against this, but I really do feel like uh, we should consider day passes. But okay. Let's have a good policy discussion, discussion on that, yeah. Okay, is there a motion to adopt ordinance 2476-16? So moved. Second. Second. Councilwoman Casalino? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes. Council President Cirillo? Yes. Ordinance 2477-16, an ordinance amending chapter 25, sections 4B, 7.1 and 9.12 of the revised ordinances of the Township of West Orange, standby power generators. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, okay. can we have this? this? I need to vote. I need to well, we can introduce vote. it, but. I know, but I need to take the vote. No, it's not introduce it, it's second reading. Yeah, it's second and final. To introduce it. On, yeah, mm-hmm. right. Councilwoman Casalino? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman McCartney? Yes, to introduce. Right. Council President Cirillo? Yes. Okay. Now I have to make a comment. Okay. So the reason that this is back on our agenda is that um, I'm going to blame her. With our Pedestrian Safety Committee uh, Commission and their, all of that, um, we've been talking about complete streets policy. So when the Planning Board made the recommendation to the Council to adopt a streets, complete streets policy, we yeah, said yes, but there was no follow through. We did not implement it in the, ter- in the form of um, master plan or uh, a checklist in any way. So you know, we need to do that. At that same time, back in 2012, we also had a presentation on standby generators. But so now that we are looking at the um, complete streets ordinance to come back or policy to come back, we're also looking at the standby generators to come back. But between 2012 and now, this, a lot has happened. So there, I have the agenda from December 13, 2012 with Janice Gary Adams and then Chairman uh, Bagoff, our Planning Board Council, Pat Dwyer. There were PSE and J, a lot of people there. So there were a lot of questions raised on that agenda um, that really are in a limbo the same way that this is in a limbo. Um, There were more discussions on the Planning Board about the standby generators and speaking to Tom Tracy and Janice Gary Adams just today, they feel that what we're proposing can't really be implemented, that it needs to be updated. They need to look at it. Um, so, and I don't know what the terminology is. Are we, if they're asking us to table it or postpone it until they have more time to look at it. There were things about the 10-foot setbacks, 10-foot uh, 
it's too restrictive. Um, it can't be more restrictive than what all the, the policy that currently is on the books. Mm -hmm. This can happen. Uh, they talk about, in our ordinance, it talks about landscaping. Really a portable or a, a standby generator can't have landscaping. It needs to aerate. Oh, yeah. um, different things about the setbacks. They say that everything has to be looked at on an individual basis. For the most part, the ordinance is okay. But a lot of these issues that are in here re, uh, apply to a, a PERD zone, a plan unit, residential development zone, which would be a condominium association. So it can't really have all of these, this ordinance be a blanket ordinance for every condominium association because they're all different. Well, then right. you, so they need to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, Thank you for providing that background. Mm -hmm. Council President, my, then Councilwoman, so basically on your, on your dissertation here is that we should table this ordinance and look at it again and have the professionals come in yes. and explain it in more detail and what needs to be changed. So, and, and this is very good. I'm glad you brought this to our attention. So Council President, I, I think is, is it appropriate for me to s suggest that we table this ordinance until? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Before we do that, we <laughs> should ask the members of the public for input. Oh, um, sorry, I forgot. For a second well, reading. The only issue with and that it, is if there's going to be cha changes to recommendation or explanation, yeah. the public won't have the benefit of that as well. So you may want to. I think just, um, well, what's the term? I don't know. How do you just? What is it's a table. Thing. Deny it, or just how do you just well, defeat it? Or defeat it, like, and then it can come back on first reading because this is not what that. they want. Yeah, take a vote. That's why. Right. Up. So we'll take, take a vote, take a vote to. Okay. okay. Yes, we have a member of the public right. that wishes to address the council on this um, <laughs> ordinance. I couldn't think of the word. Claire Sylvester, 20 Grandview Avenue. I, I, I want to be the representative of, of John Q. Public here and ask <laughs> why. Um, why was this ordinance introduced and approved on first reading um, before the people in the administration who should be responsible for this hadn't weighed in? I mean, this isn't really the way we should be doing legislation. Um, it just, you know, that's, that's my question. Why, you know, I, I, if we should pull it, we should pull it. But the question that I have is how did it get here in the first place? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claire. And I mean, my understanding of the process is that uh, when we introduce an ordinance of first reading, there's still a possibility of amending in the interim yes, and, as we know. and getting feedback. So um, before it gets to uh, second reading. But. Uh, and that all happened on Friday, and these are too substantial for the changes to be made for tonight. Sure. So, so what I would recommend is for the council to vote down the uh, ordinance tonight and then it goes back to the drawing board and it would be reintroduced back on first reading. Can I ask Councilman? You? Okay. Oh, go ahead. If I could, I think this is a really good time to also repeat something I've asked for before, which is that we discuss ordinances on first mm -hmm. reading. Our process now, our, I don't know if it's a policy or just the practice, is we just vote to introduce it and we hardly ever talk about it. I, I have to f fight sometimes just to un, just to actually read the title. But I think maybe this is an yeah, example of why we need to have further discussion of ordinances on first reading so that we can get this stuff out now and uh, I mean, it, and, and not wait till the second. Joe, we rarely agree, but I, I have always said that. <laughs> I, I, I so this is the one, th I, I have always said that. Yeah, sure. I, and I agree as well. I think it well, well, makes take. sense. Absolutely. Can I ask a question about yes. procedure with, with ordinances? Um, so when it comes even on first reading, obviously legal looks at it, does it go, and this goes back to some prior ordinances we had and some, ish, some con issues I had in, in asking questions and being out of order with them. But do, you, do they go to the various department heads to make sure that the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted? Like, would they go, like if you, got, you have this, would it automatically go to the planning board or wherever it needs to make the circle around well, the di various department first heads? First of all, every ordinance is different. There yeah. will, you know, the, anything that involves zoning has to go to the planning board for mm -hmm. approval before you can deal with it. Um, th but look. I mean, I don't, it may have been, I don't know. Oh, it was, okay. But in, in any event, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't amend ordinances. You can either you exactly. vote them down yeah. or, and, you know, make changes or, or you adopt them. And you can always make changes later. You know, every, nothing you guys do is in stone. 
Okay. All right. So you can always make changes down the road. Okay. Um, but it has to be advertised. The whole purpose yeah. is to give notice to the public. So when they come in on second reading, they've seen the ordinance that's going to get passed. If you're going to make changes to it, you, you can't, then you've got to start over again. So the clean way to do it is just vote it down and go back to it later on. Start over. But I guess my question was it, it should go to the department head before it even gets to us. But in this case, you said they, well, they it did see it. On, I mean, some ordinances come from legal, some come from departments. It depends on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. I think this, Thank again, you. this was one of those circumstances where it was introduced a few years back and now it's resurfaced, sure. but it just needed to be looked at again. Okay. I will entertain a motion to um, move uh, ordinance 2477-16. So moved. Move to defeat. Move to, <laughs> move to right. Okay. Madam Clerk? Uh, Councilwoman Casalino? Uh, yes. To defeat. To defeat. No, 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 no,